complications with my uh, I had complications with my with my microphone. So I just want to welcome everyone, and we have a a, a full a full schedule today. So thank you uh, for coming, and for those who are participating. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm glad the technology is working, Verilyn. I always celebrate when that, because I know we often take it for granted, but it doesn't always go smoothly, but we're good at modifying and adjusting. Okay, so. Uh, good morning. This is Letitia McDonald with Health and Human Services Commission. I did yeah. notice on the uh, on the, the meeting for June, I, I wasn't here. I was out, but Y'all have Suzanne Alley on there and, and she's no longer with us. I'm I'm taking her place. There's actually we sent out an updated um notes for for June. So maybe check your email or I'm happy to okay. resend that to the members really quickly. Okay, That's thank helpful. you. Yeah, thank definitely. You. Appreciate it. Well, welcome, Leticia. Thanks. So Sherry, do you think, um, should we give folks a moment to check their inboxes for updated minutes? Yes, definitely. And I will, I'll resend them. It'll just take me just a second to pull up the newer version. I think while we're doing that, let me just go ahead and move on to some other business that's you know within our subcommittee business is to talk about um give, provide a membership update one of the things that um, or also as we just know that there, we just received word that um that there's uh, a change in one of our sort of roster based on some shipping staffing um but I don't know if we're going to get to this right away, but just a little preview. Um, we are also going to be voting to um, include a new member on the subcommittee, um, which is the sort of the, de the department or the unit of family health services at HHSC. Um, and I know in a bit, Jay Smith in that unit will be, I think, joining us to sort of tell us a little bit about what programs and services are um, sort of in, in their purview. And then also super excited is that we will have a chance to um, vote in a new youth representative. And so, um, again, I don't know I, if we might get to that a little bit later, depending on what, while Dr. Harvey um, is able to join us, um, probably momentarily for the first agenda item, which is hearing about the children's mental health plan update. Um, one of the things to do those, well, again, just to sort of, I know everybody, you know, should have received an agenda, but just to walk us through, you know, to give an idea of what we will be doing for the rest of our time together. So we're going to be taking care of just sort of that business, some of our subcommittee business. Um, and then we're going to hear from Dr. Uh, we'll hear also from Dr. Courtney Harvey, um, to give us an update on the, um, the children's mental health strategic plan that is being um, that is being developed, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we as the subcommittee can help inform that work. Um, we're going to hear, you know, a brief update from HHSC's children's mental health program. Um, I know we heard a lot of, I think, some exciting um, activities that were going on during our last meeting, um, pilots that have been, you know, some new services that have been rolling out, and some um, you know, sort of updates following the legislative session. We are then going to break for lunch. And then in the afternoon, we um, are gonna be focusing our attention on taking a look at suicide. And we've gotten a great panel um, sort of who's, who will be joining us this afternoon, who will be sharing some information with us. Um, our goals really, I think for this afternoon presentation is to increase our awareness of what are some of the most recent suicide um, prevention trends in, among youth in Texas. Um, and then also to learn more about what are some things that are happening um, at the state level and at community levels um, to address youth suicide. And then through those conversations um, if, for our group, the subcommittee to provide some you know, um, input, um, 
you know, potential recommendations or considerations to the folks that are all a part of this conversation. And then also always to think about, are there ways that we as a subcommittee, you know, are there things that we might want to consider as we continue to inform both the Behavioral Health Advisory Council or, or committee, excuse me, um, or then also thinking about, you know, our work in supporting the systems of care across the state. Um, then after that, we will be hearing some updates um, from our SAMHSA grant activities. Um, and then also want to mention that there will be an opportunity to provide public comment towards the end of the meeting. And if anybody is interested uh, to provide co public comment to to Cybus, our subcommittee, if you could just jot some information down in the chat box to let our folks know um, who are operating diligently behind the scene to keep our technology running. So that's just a quick overview of our day. And let me see. I just popped over, forgive me, I was reviewing the agenda on a different screen, so I wasn't in this Zoom room. Um, can someone say, is, is Dr. Harvey available to join us? He's on. Or Okay, well, great. So folks, um, do you think we could move ahead and then hear from Dr. Harvey? Well, then let's go. Good morning, Dr. Harvey. I give you the floor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you today. Um, I have one logistical question. Am I able to share my screen uh, so that I can share my PowerPoint presentation or would it be better if I sent it to someone uh, really fast to project it? Share your screen, please. Okay, all right, excellent. Yeah, I think I have everything set up so you should be able to do that. Okay, thank you. Ruby. Can't see all of my icons, so bear with me a little bit. Dr. Harvey, it always makes me feel better when other people, you know, have to hunt and peck around, even after all this time using technology and Zoom, it still takes a minute. I am the world's worst millennial, I tell people. So I'm like, if there is any kind of stereotype that millennials will gra are great with technology, I am like, I'm the outlier because <laughs> that is not me. <laughs> so I'm glad to be here uh, with you all today to talk about the uh, Children's Mental Health um, Strategic Plan. So I want to start by going over uh, the requirements for a children's uh, mental health strategic plan and the rider that is authorizing the development of the plan. Uh, this past um, legislative session, the statewide behavioral health coordinating council was given a directive by the legislature to develop a children's mental health strategic plan. Now, some of you might say, who is this group and why were they given the directive to develop a children's mental health strategic plan? I'll give you a bit of a backstory about uh, the Statewide Behavioral Health Coordinating Council. Um, the Statewide Behavioral Health Coordinating Council was established out of the 84th legislative session. And it is comprised of uh, state agencies, representatives from the uh, two high courts in Texas, the Supreme Court of Texas and um, Court of Criminal Appeals. We also have um, institutions of higher education that serve on the council. What draws us together is that everybody who is a member of the coordinating council is receiving state um, and uh, or federal um, funding to deliver behavioral health services or to provide to communities a behavioral health training. A few of the deliverables that the statewide behavioral health coordinating council is responsible for is every five years publishing a behavioral health strategic plan. Uh, we are also responsible for annually publishing a report that says, hey, public, this is the amount of money that members serving on the coordinating council, um, not 
members individually, but the organizations that we represent um, are receiving to um, deliver behavioral health training and services. And then we also publish a report that um, tells a story about how much of those um, allocated funds we are spending. And then we also have to annually publish a, a progress report on our implementation of the behavioral health strategic plan. So over time, um, the Coordinating Council has not just published a behavioral health strategic plan. Uh, we've also published other strategic plans, uh, such as an IDD strategic plan. Um, we've also um, published a plan dealing with gel diversion and people that are on uh, forensic commitments. So we're not a council that is um, not known for um, publishing strategic plans. That's that's a part of our business. And so now we are required to publish a children's mental health strategic plan. What is slightly different about um, this strategic plan than the other strategic plans that we uh, have been directed to publish in the past is that instead of it being the responsibility of the coordinating council proper to develop the strategic plan, this rider required that the coordinating council um, develop a subcommittee. And it's actually the subcommittee's responsibility to develop uh, the children's mental health strategic plan. This strategic plan is going to be due to uh, the legislature um, and office of the governor uh, December 1st of 2024. So some of the uh, elements or data or information that has to be included in the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan is what you see before you on, on the slide. Um, we have to uh, talk about who is providing what services and to what children. Uh, we have to include strategies to identify and address gaps in care for this population, a discussion of workforce shortages, information on funding and reimbursement and children-specific data and expenditure information. I will say that uh, even though this plan in the rider um, is titled a children's mental health strategic plan, and because it's titled that in the rider, when we talk publicly about this plan, we reference it as a children's mental health strategic plan. One of the questions that I have been getting from stakeholders is, will this plan also include a substance use information. Um, and our answer, when I say our, I'm speaking now on behalf of the coordinating council, is that um, it will include substance use information, though we're not quite sure how the substance use piece will be um, integrated. But I just want you to know that as an FYI. Some of the um, organizations that are specifically referenced in the rider that have to participate on the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan subcommittee include um, some state agencies, HHSC or the Health and Human Services Commission, uh, the Department of State Health Services, a Department of Family and Protective Services, the Texas Education Agency, and the Texas Juvenile Justice Department. We've also invited the Texas Workforce Commission to serve um, on the subcommittee because employment is a really uh, critical um, factor in uh, people being able to um, have good health, physical health um, and behavioral health. And they do have a certain programs that promote um, employment in um, the adolescent population. So we thought that they were a critical member. We also have to have a medical practitioners with expertise um, and facilities which provide inpatient and outpatient care. And in a later slide, um, we lay out for you who the members um, on the subcommittee are. We don't have their individual names, but we at least have um, a reference to the organizations that they represent. 
So again, we've got a representation from the Texas Medical Association, um, My Health, My Resources, Tarrant County, which is the local mental health authority or MHMR that serves um, the Fort Worth area. We've got a representation from the National Alliance of Mental Illness Texas, uh, the Center for Young Minds, uh, the Collaborative Task Force on School Mental Health Services, which is a task force that um, is operated by the Texas Education Agency the Texas Alliance for Child and Family Services, the National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health, the National Alliance on um, Mental Illness, Texas, which I'm sorry is a, a repeat, Betty Hardwick Center, which is a, another local mental health authority or MHMR, representation from uh, the Children, Youth, and Behavioral Health Services uh, subcommittee, the Children's Commission, um, the University of Texas at Austin, a Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health, Texas Family Voice Network, Texas Association of Community Health Centers, Children's Hospital Association of Texas, Behavioral Health Executive Council, and the Texas Pediatric Society. So we knew when we um, put together the membership for the subcommittee that we wanted to have a mix of um, people with lived experience. When I say people with lived experience, I'm not just talking about parents, but also uh, youth with lived experience. Um, we wanted to have representation from um, individuals representing the child welfare system. Uh, we wanted to have representation from um, the judiciary um, payers, which is a really important uh, element of this, um, and um, providers. So as far as um, the scope for uh, the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan, um, what we have elected to do is use um, the system of care philosophy and model as the uh, framework for the plan. Um, we really felt like this was important because ultimately what we want to build is systems of care um, for children and uh, families. And what I have discovered since being in um, this role with the Health and Human Services Commission is that a lot of times when I reference system of care, people A, maybe aren't necessarily familiar with the model or B, um, if they are familiar with the model, they are most familiar with it within the context of the grant program that HHSC operates, such that their knowledge is really about the grant. And um, at this point, school-based mental health services that are provided through the grant, not necessarily the model. Uh, and I have been saying to Sherry and Lillian and others in the agency, like I want, I want people to understand the philosophy um, and the national model. And yes, we want people to know about our grant, but I really want there to be a focus on um, the philosophy. And so we really wanted to leverage this children's mental health strategic plan to um, bring attention to the system of care of framework and philosophy, but also um, in the types of organizations that really have to come to the table as we think through what is really an appropriate continuum of care for children and families. Um, we need a host of organizations that aren't necessarily providing direct mental health services, but are people, organizations that lay eyes on children and families and are providing um, supports that work to keep people well. Um, they are very much a part of this continuum of care for children and families, and we wanted to be able to um, elevate their perspective as well. Um, and then I've also got on here, and I won't take the time to go through this because I know just by virtue of your membership, you're probably familiar with some of the major tenets of the system of care um, philosophy. Um, but we also wanted to bring attention to the fact that, and this happens later on down the line, um, if you are an organization or you're a person who says, um, you know, we endorse the system of care philosophy, we endorse the model, what does that really look like within your organization? Like, how do you hear and engage with and uh, take feedback um, regarding the feedback that um, you're getting from youth who are receiving services, that you're getting from um, parents and caregivers um, who are receiving services? How do they really drive um, the treatment that they receive? 
are you really um, delivering services in the least restrictive um, setting? Are you delivering services in a way that um, contemplates the unique needs of people who um, may not speak English as their first language or who show up and look like me as a Black woman, a parent in your services? Um, like, can you speak to the things that resonate with me? me and uh, contribute to my lens on health when I come into your office. Anyway, I get very passionate about that one um, just because of my own healthcare journey and how dismissive people can be with me who don't know that I'm Dr. Harvey, who don't know that I'm an associate commissioner with HHSC um, and take me at face value when I show up and meet with them about me and my children um, in a different way until I tell them who the hell I am. But I shouldn't have to tell you who I am to get good care and to be considered like with a sense of agency on what me and my kids need. Anyway, that's my soapbox. Um, time frame. So we decided that we would um, build a strategic plan that is um, on a five-year time frame and that we want to cross-reference this children's mental health strategic plan's connection to the larger umbrella behavioral health strategic plan, but we didn't want this children's mental health strategic plan to be a sub-plan of the behavioral health strategic plan for a number of reasons. Some of those reasons include who wants to read a 300 like page plan? It'll be a doorstop. We don't want this to be a doorstop. Um, two, we feel like there are certain um, populations that really do require uh, focused at attention, um, children and families being one. And so we wanted this to be a five-year plan that is a standalone plan. By standalone, I mean, it's going to be a separate plan from the behavioral health strategic plan, but it will be, um, connected to the umbrella plan. So this strategic plan is going to run from a fiscal year uh, 2025 through um, 2029. The age range uh, for the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan is going to be birth through uh, 17. I will say that there were recommendations from stakeholders that the age range for the plan be birth through age 22, be birth through uh, up to age 26. People really wanted to um, focus on that transitional age youth population, but based on the way that systems design services for who they consider a child, who they consider an adolescent. Um, we decided to cover uh, children birth through 17 with there at some point being a recommendation to the statewide behavioral health coordinating council that eventually there be a strategic plan for transitional age youth because they have really unique um, needs that somebody should be attuning to um, in, a, in a strategic plan kind of way. Um, I didn't mention this when I was going over the requirements in the rider, but one of the things that the rider requires is that in this plan, we talk about um, the full continuum of care. And um, I remember that in our initial children's mental health strategic plan meeting, one or a few people said, what do we mean by the continuum of care? <laughs> like, what what is it? Um, how are we going to define it? And so um, that is something that we are going to be working to um, define. We we being the subcommittee um, who's working on the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan to define the continuum of care. And Dr. Lopez, uh, Lillian Wynn, uh, Sherry, others um, has sent us information um, related to articles published on the system of care that, in my opinion, really do kind of lay out um, well what a full continuum of care for children and families um, should look like. Um, and so the subcommittee is going to be getting into more of those discussions over the course of the next few months. And then in terms of uh, service providers, um, there was a question about whether or not service providers would be um, those that um, receive state funds. 
um, to provide behavioral health services or were we going to be including all sectors that might receive state funds, but that not might not be the majority of the funding that they utilize to provide services. And we decided that um, we didn't just want it to focus on providers that are attached to um, state infrastructure from a regulatory perspective. We also wanted to include nonprofits, uh, for-profits, and uh, other types of organizations that are um, involved in delivering behavioral health treatment or supports. So that at a um, high level is the uh, Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan work that has been done um, to date. Um, so far in the meetings, we've had some presentations from um, Dr. Marsha Ori and Dr. Israel Liberzon, who are with uh, Texas A&M University. For people who may not know, Texas A&M University, this legislative session was appropriated $1.5 million to do a study on children and adolescent um, mental health services. And so I have standing bi-monthly meetings with doctors Ori and Liberzon um, to be sure that there is synergy and alignment between the two-year study that they are conducting um, and the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan um, that's being written. So we've heard from them as a subcommittee. Um, this month, we're meeting the week after next, if I'm not mistaken, um, we're going to receive some presentations from uh, representatives from um, Medicaid and CHIP services with the Health and Human Services Commission, as well as our uh, Children's Mental Health um, Unit to talk through the array of um, behavioral health services um, reimbursable under Medicaid, paid for through um, GR, who our providers are, um, the array of services. And then I think they'll also maybe get into uh, outcomes as well. Um, and then um, we're finalizing our mission, vision, and um, guiding principles with the idea that in January, we'll actually start to really dig into data um, and start to work on um, developing strategies and um, recommendations that will be in the plan. So with that, uh, uh, I'll stop and I'll ask for uh, questions and I'm trying to man the chat. Uh, I do see that there's a question. Am I supposed to be doing this, y'all? <laughs> if somebody else is supposed to be doing this, just be like, girl, no, that is my job. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Harvey. I'm happy to read you questions from the chat. Okay. All right. Thank you, right, Sherry. Welcome. Sure. So we do have a question from Stephen. I hope I'm saying your first name correctly, Cole. Um, his question is, what can parents do in a rural area when the places don't respond? Um, there's a lack of professionals or just tell people to call someone else. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a really great question. And that is one of the things that we are trying to unveil or bring attention to in our crafting of the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan is um, um, provider network adequacy. Um, what does that look like in rural communities compared to uh, urban communities? How are people getting access to treatment? What do telehealth services look like, for example? What are the kinds of um, behavioral health professionals who are delivering um, these services? How do people access care? Uh, and your question is uh, a good one. Right now, I think when people feel like they go to places who aren't responsive or they lack professionals in their area to deliver services, et cetera, people uh, go to the emergency room, which is horrible, right? It's what we don't want. It's one of the most costly places um, to receive care. When I say we don't want it, if you, certainly if you need that level of care, to meet your need, do that. Um, but so many people turn to emergency rooms and other places because to your point, there may not be other providers in the area to deliver services or um, they don't have access to professionals or those professionals who they do have access say, call someone else. If people are insured, one of the things I think we don't necessarily think to do is um, call your insurance call them, um, ask to speak to a representative, 
there are oftentimes, if you have insurance, people who you can call and ask to get you connected to care. Um, I, I'm with Blue Cross Blue Shield Health Selective Texas as a state employee. Um, and so I I, I should know, I don't always use this as a resource, but right, like call Blue Cross Blue Shield and say, I'm having a difficult time finding a provider who can deliver X, Y, and Z, like, can you help me? So if you're insured, um, a lot of times there is assistance to help you navigate that that people don't necessarily think to use. Um, if you're uninsured, um, some of the places that you might want to target could be, right? Your local mental health authority could be an FQHC if you've got access um, to one in your community, uh, your public health departments. Um, might provide a degree of behavioral health services, I'm not sure. And then also I think um, if you've got a primary care physician, like medical professionals can provide a degree of, of behavioral health services, right? So but part of, I think, what um, we should be working to unveil, not just in this plan, but using this plan as an example, is kind of like a revisioning of who we consider to be behavioral health professionals. To me, if you are a professional who comes across somebody that you know has a behavioral health issue, you are a behavioral health professional. <laughs> uh, we need to be sure that you are trained and have the tools that you need in order to provide care in accordance with what you're trained to do and then refer out in as much as you can um, to other people that might um, be able to provide a level of care that is beyond what you can do. I don't know if that answers your question, Stephen. It's an imperfect answer, um, imperfect I'm, situation. I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering too if, at least I know I personally, when I think about planning for uh, mental health service, or at least some of the state's work on increasing access to mental health services in rural mm -hmm. areas, I think of the All Texas All Access Texas. Plan. Yes. And so what I'm wondering is, I think this is interesting too, as the coordinating council is developed, you know, or because it has already developed its coordinated strategic plan, but even the mental health, the children's mental health strategic plan, mm -hmm. um, are there are there ways that the, the strategies or the information that's included in the All Texas Access mm -hmm. um, work that's being done is informing those other work? Those are the products. For sure. Yes. Uh Joe said. So just so um you all have some degree of insight, I'll talk a little bit about HHSC's process, but then um what that coordination looks like uh with some of the member agencies that serve on the coordinating council. So for HHSC, um, as an example, anytime we get ready to um develop our behavioral health exceptional items, like we review the all Texas access plan, we review uh, recommendations from advisory committees um uh, that we get in the reports that they publish, et cetera. And um we consider the strategies and recommendations that are included in those reports and use them to inform um, what might go into our behavioral health EI. Now, I will say beyond that, a, a request for um, general revenue to um, implement some of these strategies or to expand implementation. The other thing that we do um, that with is like our mental health block grant dollars. Um, so a lot of times when we um, identify carryover funds from our mental health block grant, our mental health block grant is funds that we get from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. There. Um, there are some parameters in terms of how we use uh, those funds in terms of what we can fund or cannot fund. But we do use, I, I, I mentioned that as one um, example to say, we look at other funding opportunities to also implement those strategies um, to supplement what we're getting in GR or sometimes to bypass the GR request and to use mental health block grant funds to implement some of those strategies or recommendations. Um, so that is one way 
one of the things that the coordinating council does, um, one of the things that we are required to do uh, biennially is to do um, a vetting of our um, exceptional items. And exceptional items is, is um, a request for funding that is going to be beyond kind of our base allocation for services. We have to vet not all exceptional items, but um, just behavioral health exceptional items. So um, generally that vetting occurs in the summer before the session. Um, what we are going to start to do in January is come together as coordinating council member agencies to talk about two things, um, uh, exceptional item concepts. So we won't have things fleshed out or finalized or anything like that in January, but just to talk about concepts that might inform our request. Um, and then also to talk about statutory initiatives um, I'm trying to think how to explain a statutory initiative. So a statutory initiative um, is um, a request that uh, we might make to the legislature regarding a change to um, a law um, that would help us to better administer our joint business in terms of the services that we provide um, to clients that we're jointly um, serving. So those conversations, um, we'll start in January for session planning for the 88th. And again, um, Joe said, even with some of the concepts that, I, I, speaking for HHSC that we've started to uh, think through, we're pulling some of the ideas for those concepts from these plans that have been published. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's great information, too. And I think it's a good reminder for all of us to um, sort of recognize what are those opportunities where we can, you know, not only make specific recommendations and provide feedback um, from our own internal conversations, but then as part of that, look to what are some of the other recommendations or strategies that are included um, in different other reports or strategic plans and really, you know, give almost our endorsement saying, yes, this is important for children and families, mm -hmm. um, or even looking to or recognizing if some of the issues that are, you know, sort of identified in the, you know, rural mental health um, mm -hmm. sort of planning. I mean, it sounds like we're going to have some public comment later on from Mr. Cole, who will just sort of share it appears their experience in trying to access services. And so I think for us as a collective, um, it, it's helpful for us to remember that um, I, keeping in mind what are all the different places and conversations that are going on related to um, mental health and seeing how we can help um, make sure that children and families are sort of reflected in that work or, or that the needs of children and families help to inform it. Yeah, I um, think sometimes, um members serving on um, subcommittees, your work is really hard, right? Or advisory committees, because oftentimes folks are like, we're making recommendations, but we don't see any movement on it. Um, and the agency could do a better job of circling back with the committee to say, here's here's like how we are using your recommendation, here are the actions that we're planning um, related to your recommendation. And I, there's certain documents obviously that I can't share publicly, but I can just like explain for some of the EI conversations that are happening now, what the spreadsheet looks like where we are we are, have like a list of the concepts that we want to explore. Some of the questions that we're asking ourselves is like, um, is this something that's funded by another state agency? And if so, if we wanted to put forth this request, what would our sub, uh, what would we be supplementing, right? Like we wanna be sure that we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul, so to speak, that there's not supplantation of funds, that kind of thing. Um, there's a column for, has this been a recommendation by an advisory committee? What is the research that supports this concept, right? Um, so that is very much a part of the conversation that um, we have and, and we use that as justification for um, the concept that we want to carry forward. Now, I will be honest with y'all. I always tell people EIs is like, uh, think sea turtles, right? You start off with like, I don't know. 
I don't know how many sea turtles start out, 500, and let's just say only 20 make it to the ocean. That's in a that's a that's a sensationalized number. But I'm just saying, um, I also want to set like realistic expectations about the number of like concepts that might be carried forward. We start off with many. Um, it is very hard to get them through um, the, the finish line. So if we started out with 10, maybe there's three, uh, which is why looking for those other financial opportunities outside of um, the, the legislative process is really important. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and I know I think there's some other questions that maybe came in that might be, um, I think we, we could address either like later on in some future conversations um, and uh, re relating to children's services. Um, so thank you. Oh, Verilyn, I see that you have your hand up. Yes, I, I've been trying to get this question in and my computer decided didn't want to cooperate. Uh, but I want to know, in a nutshell, how do I explain this strategic uh, committee to parents in the community as to the benefits that they will be having from this uh, subcommittee? And second part, you mentioned substance use as being part of, perhaps part of this, but is there a placement for autism and IDD services as well? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So to address your uh, first question about how do you explain it, Berlin, I know that you're actually on the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan subcommittee. So one mm -hmm. of the things that we have done, it's already in the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan SharePoint that you have access to, um, and we're going to beef this up over time, is we've got some uh, PowerPoint presentations and talking points in the folder. So, and the reason that we are developing that and we'll update the those over time is because we we want stakeholders to spread the message, but we want our message to be consistent. Um, so I can send those to you, um, Berlin. And if other members of the CIBIS want those as well, um, we can share them with you. But that gives you um, some talking points on the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan. Now, to your point about what can parents expect in terms of benefits of the plan? Um, we haven't really addressed that in the talking points, but I do think that's important. And so uh, we can take that back. I'm looking at Sherry. I'm like, Sherry, please help me remember. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm so, monitoring chat. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> help, or Nydia, I see Nydia. I'm like, somebody <laughs> ping me um, to remember that we need to make an update to um, the talking point to incorporate um, that perspective, because I do think that is a really important. Um, so I'm going to commit to maybe putting something together within the next few weeks, y'all. Um, but we'll get those out to members who are on the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan subcommittee. And again, members of the CIBIS too, so that you you can use it in the various forms that you're in. Um, I see you, Nydia. Thank you. Then your other comment about um, substance use services and whether or not there will be um, mention of individuals with um, IDD or autism. Hope I didn't get that wrong, Verilyn. Um, That's a great question. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, I say I don't know because on the one hand, I want to say, yeah, I would think that there would be some mention of individuals who have IDD, uh, IDD um, or who have an autism uh, diagnosis, but also have co-occurring um, behavioral health conditions. So I think where there's a co-occurring um, presence, that is certainly going to be within the scope of the plan, but for individuals that have IDD or an autism diagnosis, um, and that is the primary, and there's the absence of a behavioral health um, uh, co-occurrence, then I don't think that would be within the scope. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us and giving us, you know, that update and that review of this, which really I think is is a great um, sort of effort and initiative that will help to bring, you know, continued and strategic focus on how to really um, build out the continuum of care for kids. Um, one of the things that I want to say about what we as a group, um, in addition to, let's say, you know, getting access to some more information that is shared with the work group members, um, Verlin and I 
uh, and, and Sherry Rumsey have discussed that to help, at, as was mentioned, um, Verlin Johnson is a, a CIBIS representative who is serving on the task force that is you know, developing the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. um, so we have that, you know, we have that direct linkage, but knowing that, um, and again, because this is a work intensive thing, it's not just about, you know, a broad strokes plan. It's they're really getting into, into the weeds, I think into the details and, and developing it then um, the, the final plan. So what we proposed is if um, creating sort of an ad hoc subcommittee or work group, really a work group within CIBIS of people who are interested um, in assisting Verlin in, again, maybe reviewing the information and then also looking to see how to translate some of the, um, the, the considerations and the recommendations that we discuss here in CIBIS yes. to what is going on in developing the strategic plan. So um, what if you are interested in serving, you know, do having some more um, specific conversations about um, the development of the children's mental health plan, um, and and again, uh, helping to provide you know voice and information from our group Cybus and assisting Vera Lynn in doing that. If you would uh, enter your name and your organization in the chat. Um, and then again, asking if somebody could sort of collect that information and we can follow up with you. Um, uh, and can I, I say something too, Josette, to that? Yes, I think please. that's a great idea. And also like one of the things that I mentioned um, to Sherry is that as as the plan starts to be developed, as we get pen to paper, we want to leverage the CIBES to review iterations of the plan. So as you're talking, I'm also thinking, I mean, not to say that the entire CIBES wouldn't review iterations because we want to give everybody an opportunity, but um, it, at least for this working group um, to maybe be kind of a central hub for the CIBES um, in terms of like, reviewing iterations of the plan and then working with um, the broader group um, to review, um, that would be really helpful for us. Oh, thank you. Yes, thank you for those opportunities. And again, recognizing that um, we want this to be thoughtful work. And then so I think, again, having, you know, a work group that can help think through these things. And then again, like really, truly having CIBIS informing the work and then helping to bring information from that from the task force back yeah, to back. our group. Mm -hmm. So I think just a little bit, I can see the chat um, box. There's some there's some volunteers that are popping in there. Um, and so thank you and again, reminding anybody and then um, who might be interested and then we will reach out to you to figure out what that might look like um, and think through the process, so. And if you have um, other questions related to the Children's Mental Health Strategic Plan Initiative, um, I think you have um, on your slide still um, the uh, mailbox. This is the, the Coordinating Council mailbox, um, but I've got access to the mailbox. Um, people that support the Coordinating Council on my team have access to the mailbox. So if you'll email the mailbox, um, we'll get your um, questions answered. Great, thank you. Thank you so, again, thank you so much. And I think now we can move on. What I'm wondering is, can someone um, who's monitoring, you know, the back door, um, or at least our attendance rate, or is just more looking at the technical side, do we have a quorum that we might be able to um, approve the minutes and then maybe vote in some new members? I understand that we do have a quorum. Yay. So. I ask this question every time. Do we need an official motion to approve the minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't motion know. motion to approve the minutes. <laughs> oh, it looks like somebody so moves in the chat. And I second. Thank you, Lily. So um, if somebody, if members, if you are officially a member, um, I know we have a lot of great um, valuable stakeholders that are joining us too, but if you are an official member that is on the roster of the CIBIS, if you can go ahead and put in the chat, if you approve um, the meeting minutes as was sent in your email. Awesome.
I am guessing because this is relatively not controversial that we probably have approved the minutes, if that correct. So I would say, so moved, the minutes have been approved. Um, thank you all. Now, um, Sherry, would you mind, can we hand it off to you to introduce you know, some of the, the, the new members um, that we will have the opportunity to vote in to officially join Cybus? Yeah, I'd love to start with our proposed youth representative um, who's not with us today, but um, I want to share some information about him. Um, I think that the members should have received his background and his resume for review. Um, if not, again, I'm happy to send that back out or I can read a little bit. I can probably pull it up pretty quickly. But a um, little background, uh, his name is Rohan Satija, and he actually reached out to us and expressed an interest in becoming a youth representative for Cybus, which was very exciting. Um, and since we don't currently have an active uh, accept youth council, we ran his information through our nominating work group, and they did approve moving forward with a recommendation that he be presented to Cybus for a vote to become a youth representative. So if y'all will give me just a second, I will pull up his information um, and tell you a little bit more about him just so as people who might not have received um, the email can hear about him. And maybe you can drop in the chat if you need me to send something back out. Um, so Rohan shared, um, his, again, his interest, he searched us up, searched us out. Sorry, I'm using my daughter's language, um, and shared that he is currently a junior at Westwood High School in Williamson County. He serves on the Williamson County Youth Behavioral Health Subcommittee and participates in some of his, some of their work groups, uh, Youth and Family Voice, and School-Based Diversion Improvements. He's actually the co-founder of a nonprofit um, that focuses on promoting education and mental health awareness, and they help get mental health education kits and bookmarks to elementary and middle school students. Um, he is a member of the Changing Lives Youth Theatrical Ensemble, um, he co-founded Teen Talk, which is a club at his previous school um, that fosters discussions on mental health challenges that specifically rose from uh, COVID-19 isolation. And um, he like, came to Texas from New Zealand and shared that that was a very hard transition for him. Um, he's also had some experiences related to mental health uh, with some family members, and he is very interested in continuing his work as an advocate and being a youth uh, voice representative for Cybus. So does, do any of the members need a copy of his resume um, and background? Because I can get that back to you. I don't see anything in chat. Okay, I'd like to make a motion for us to, if, if we're ready for that, I would like to make it a motion for us to approve um, this young man's um, membership in the Cybus. I'll second. Awesome. So every member who is in favor, um, please enter in the chat. If you are in favor or not in favor. Assuming that we have enough folks who have voted to approve in the chat, I think we can officially welcome our newest member. And you can continue if you haven't posted your um, approval or not, um, please go ahead and continue to put it in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on it. Thank y'all. 
so I think, and again, we also have another member um, that we are going to ask for the committee's for the subcommittee's approval um, to join. Um, is Jay Smith available? I don't know if he is here to tell us a little bit about family health services at HHSC, or if this is something else, Sherry, that you'll be able to give us some information. Uh, Jay actually was going to do a, a really brief presentation to help us learn about family health services at HHSC, but he had a conflict this morning. He should be on within the next, I'd say, about 15 minutes, and I'm wondering if we maybe we can shift to the next agenda item. Thanks. Sure. I think that sounds good. Okay. Do we need, so according to what we need to do for this official business, um, is there anything else that's needed? Any motions, approvals? I'm going to take silence as a we are good. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, now, and wow, we are almost, it looks like we are almost um, good on time um, for the agenda to now hear, if, if you're still here, Ms. Garcia, um, this is a part of our meeting where we invite um, individuals with lived experience, either um, a young person or a family member. And this month we have with us um, Vanessa Garcia, who will be joining us. Um, I don't know, and this is also a case, Sherry, I don't know if you have an introduction for Vanessa um, or if we will just give Vanessa the floor. Nydia, can you introduce? Thank yeah, you. I can quickly introduce her. Um, thank you, Josette. So um, I'm sorry, we keep calling her Vanessa Garcia. She is Vanessa Vaughn. She's, I want to say, oh. recently married, but I guess not recently. Um, I've known Vanessa for almost 10 years, gosh, I think. And so um, anyway, she's gotten married in that time. But um, I want to welcome Vanessa Vaughn. Um, like I said, I've known her for several years. Um, she has three amazing children. Um, I'm excited to hear which one she'll talk about today or if she's going to weave all of their stories. But Vanessa has lots of experience navigating pretty much every um, child serving system that you could possibly think of. So thank you so much for being here, Vanessa, and um, give you the floor or the Zoom or the room. <laughs> the Zoom uh -huh. room. All right. Well, thank you, Nydia, for inviting me. Um, I'm glad to be here to share a little bit about our story. Um, and yes, I'm Vanessa Vaughn. I've actually been, gosh, married eight years. My husband and I have been together for 13 years, though. So it's been, it's been, a, he's, I guess he's going to stick around a while. <laughs> um, and uh, we have three, we have three children. Um, my oldest is Eileen, uh, who just turned 17 this summer. And um, she is probably the one that I will primarily focus on. She's had a lot of struggles with mental and behavioral health. Um, so I think that her story in particular is probably uh, most beneficial here today. Um, my middle son is Braxton um, and he just turned 12 this summer. And he's actually our probably, I don't know, it's a toss up between him and Eileen on who's the most involved. Um, Braxton has a rare medical disorder called Rubenstein-Tabey syndrome. Um, it essentially affects all of the system. So he has like hearing and vision issues. He has neurological issues, feeding difficulties, just a, a lot. We have almost two dozen doctors for him. Um, so we have definitely navigated the Medicaid waiver system, Medicaid in general, and um, school issues for him as well. Um, and he is, um, like I said, all his systems are affected. Um, he is still nonverbal. But he is very ambulatory. He's a rough and tumble little boy. Uh, he's constantly outside. He's jumping off the furniture and it's hard to keep his feet on the ground most days. Um, and while his condition is not terminal, it is lifelong. So he will always have some struggles. He will always live with us. He will always need support from us and um, on, on probably community services. Uh, we have not got there quite yet. So I will be on the lookout for those. And then our youngest is Brooklyn. Um, she will be seven in January and she is seven going on 17 in every sense of the word. Um, she's, uh, she's a little firecracker full of sass, but she's so incredibly smart and she's so sweet. Um, and I really can't wait to see what she does. Like she's, she will be a force. <laughs> 
Um, in addition to being a mom, um, I wear a lot of hats. Currently, I work from home for a pediatric therapy company. I'm the office manager and handle intake and referrals for patients for uh, pediatric speech, physical and occupational therapy. Um, and handle like kind of the back end and credentialing, dealing with insurance and Medicaid and everything. And um, like I said, my husband and I have been married for eight years. He is an operations manager in the oil field. So he is gone a lot. Uh, so a lot of my lived experience has been pretty much on my own. Um, when he is here, he is super supportive. He's takes the kids to the doctors, runs therapy appointments. He's bathing and feeding and cooking and cleaning and doing all the things. So uh, when he's home, it's great. It's a, it's a real, it's a great partnership. And I'm, I'm fortunate to have that support together. We also have a, a production company. We do like DJ services. Um, we do all kinds of weddings, quinceaneras, private events, corporate parties, all, all those kinds of things. So we have a very full plate. Um, so somehow we manage it all um, together. So uh, like I said, I'm really grateful that I have his support um, through all of it. Um, so when it's, with reference to Eileen, um, I guess I will try to be as brief as possible. She's 17 and we've had years of struggle. Um, so there is a lot <laughs> to our story. Um, and I will say that really her struggle started probably I would say like first grade. That was the first time that we really had any issues uh, with school. That's when they started kind of the red, green, yellow, smiley face behavior charts that would come home. And um, she was getting lots of yellow faces, lots of red faces. And I just, she's such a sweet kid and she was so smart. She's so funny, so creative. And I was just like, what is going on? Um, and it was par partially that she was social butterfly. She wanted to talk to everybody. They had a hard time keeping her on task because she wanted to talk. She wanted to share her stories. She wanted to, to meet with friends in school. Um, and also like at home, I was starting to notice issues like homework was such a fight. Like there were tears, it was screaming. She was throwing herself on the ground, like would not do the work. And to the point where I was like, there's, this is not within the realm of normal, right? Um, this is, there's something else going on. And so I tried to talk to the school about it. I had also noticed in doing the homework that she was having trouble with her writing and mixing up letters, mixing up numbers. So I did ask initially about like, okay, can we screen her for like dyslexia, dysgraphia, like something, something's going on. Um, and the school, of course, the school assured me, no, well, we kind of screen for those things on a regular basis. She's not on our radar. She's, this is all still within the realm of developmentally appropriate. So she, there are no, there are no concerns. Um, but like the issues just continue. Like I was getting phone calls every other day. I was getting notes home in the folder. And it's all, it was kind of like, a, if you're not going to help me, why are you telling me about these things? Like, what can we do if you're not going to partner with me? Like, this is pointless. Um, pretty sure that is at this point that I met Nydia, we kind of briefly talked about it. She kind of told me about pursuing testing, um, and how to go about that. And it was like, I had already asked the school, but they dismissed it. She's like, no, you need to submit it in writing. You need to get it time stamped. So that way they can't deny that you told them. And I was like, okay. Um, and that, that process still just took, it was toward the end of the school year. It took a really long time. So we ended up doing outside testing with a neuropsychiatrist um, here in town. And through that testing, we found that Eileen did have ADHD along with some signs of depression and anxiety. And the at the time, the psychiatrist said, look, sometimes depression and anxiety are just part of ADHD. Let's address that. And then we'll see where we're at with the other two. Um, <clears throat> with this testing, I was now armed with a little bit more background, a little bit more support for the school. So I took that to the school and said, look, there's a problem that you guys are missing. We need to, we need to address this. So the school finally did some testing. We got her with that initial testing. We did the fi 504 plan. Once the school completed their evaluation, she was, and she was approved for special education services and we got her set up with an IEP. So then we started finally getting some of the supports. Um, but even then it, it was still a struggle. I was like, okay, why can't we get school OT? Like she needs trouble. She's having trouble with writing. She's having trouble with her, her letters, but because she was capable of reading and because she had good language skills, they said, basically she doesn't qualify. She's, she's too smart. Basically is what they told me. 
Um, so we did outside occupational therapy. We did outside activities. Um, I tried baseball. We tried karate. We tried all kinds of things to help kind of offset that, that energy that she had. Um, and then we also, ultimately we went to the pediatrician, we started her on medication. Um, and I was really reluctant to do so at first. I mean, there's such a stigma and knowing now what I, what I know, knowing what I know now, I absolutely would not have waited. Like we would have just, that would have been the first step. Um, and one of the things that I remember very vividly after starting medication, um, probably in that first week, there was a day that she came home and she was so excited about school. And she told me um, in great detail, all the things that they did at school. We did this, we did that. We did a science experiment, the experiment. These were the steps for the experiment. This is what I learned from the experiment. Like it was amazing. And, you know, before then it was like, oh, how was school? Fine, fine, fine. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember what we did. But this day she was just like rambling everything off. And um, I was so excited for her. You know, we had a great conversation. <clears throat> Later that night, the same day, um, my husband came home from work and I was like, oh, hey, tell him what happened at school today. Like, what um, what did you do? I was like, I, I want to hear about that experiment again. Um, and when I tell you that she could not form a coherent thought, like her medication had worn off. She couldn't remember the things that she told me. I asked her, I was like, well, well, didn't you say such and such? And she was like, I think so. I don't remember. Like she just could not, couldn't get it together. Uh, so that was kind of the, a pivotal moment for me in realizing, hey, you you are doing the right thing. It is working. I know like, again, medication gets such a stigma, but for her, like that's what she needed. Um, so with her medication, with some of the school supports that we were getting, we really did see things turn around. Like she was not getting in trouble at school. She was able to focus on her schoolwork. We weren't fighting as much at home with homework um, and things like that. But I still, there were still areas where we could have gotten help that I feel like we didn't get. Um, I think the biggest thing for her is that she is so advanced in her language skills that she is able to mask a lot of the areas where she needs support. So because her language is so high, um, people kind of dismiss the things that she needs and the support that she needs. Um, and I guess kind of throughout this time we, is when we also started Braxton in school. So she was five when Braxton was born. Um, kind of the start of all of this is when we started getting into like the school-based services at age three for him. And it was such a night and day difference for me um, with Braxton trying to go to the school and trying to get support. There was no question. Like I wasn't fighting for services they were throwing things at me that I didn't even know the school offered. They were like, oh, he needs this. He needs that. Here's some here's some equipment you can use at home for him. Like, these are all the things that he need. And it was just such a stark um, moment for me as well that he was so disabled that there was no question that here's all the things that he needs to be successful at school and at home. Whereas Eileen, it was like, eh, maybe she doesn't really need that. I think she's just, she's faking it or she's too smart for that. She doesn't need the support. So just the difference in, in that experience between the two of them and, and living it at the same time, right? Like I'm going to school and I'm like, hey, look, we're getting all this support for her brother. Like, where is this level of support for her? And it, it everything was a fight. It was a fight. Um, and I think that probably for her, everything kind of came to a head. Like fourth grade was the first time that we really dealt with thoughts of suicidal ideation, self-harm, um, and things like that. She'd like drawn, she'd made a drawing at school. Um, she'd had several uh, outbursts at school, throwing her desk over and refusing to clean it up, like these big emotional mood swings and difficulties. And so we were like, okay, it's obviously the anxiety and depression came back into play. Like it's not just ADHD, there's some other stuff going on. Um, and of course, through all this time we were in counseling, we were doing all the things that we needed to do. Um, but it wasn't until this point that we really, really like, hey, there's something else going on here. Um, and we kind of muddled through it for a few years. Um, seventh grade, so once she hit middle school, that was kind of the, the most difficult. Like fifth and sixth grade were probably the most difficult years. Fifth grade is right when you start having 
um, like the mean girl issues. And she was having trouble with making friends and the girls were talking about her behind her back and, you know, all, all, all the things that come with being a preteen, <clears throat> the very confusing, very difficult years. And, um, and it was for her, she just didn't, she couldn't find a place to fit in. She couldn't figure out who she was. Her self-esteem was very low. And, um, and what turns out it would have been spring of 2017. <clears throat> um, she had, um, an incident with a peer at school and we didn't find out about it until months later. And uh, while I do have her permission to share most of her story, and I'm sure she wouldn't mind me sharing, I it's still not my story to tell. So I will leave out the details, but um, there was an incident that happened and um, authorities got involved. We tried to go through all the proper channels. And unfortunately, there it was, he said, she said, your story, your word against mine. None of the stories matched up. They couldn't figure out what actually happened. And so it was dismissed. Um, but before we found out about it, she had tried to deal with it on her own. She was bottling up those emotions that came with that incident um, to the point that fall 2018 school started again. She started seeing this peer around campus again, and she was very triggered. She was very um, much unable to hold it together. And she had her first hospitalization Um a first acute stay at Dell Children's Mental Hospital, um, or the mental, the children's mental health ward of the Dell Children's. Um, and even then, what had happened in the spring didn't come out um, until much, much later. Um, but during this initial visit, it's kind of we were like, okay, what's what's going on? She, we changed counselors, we changed medication. Dell Children's tried to get us onto a different kind of a plan. Um, we tried to find a new psychiatrist, but the issue was, you know, we didn't, they didn't take insurance. They didn't um, have availability for the hours that would work with our schedule. They didn't, they weren't close enough to home for us. You know, it was an hour and a half both ways to, to get her into, to see a doctor. And of course, you know, I did what I could. I wasn't going to let her continue to struggle. So we, we made the appointments and we drove. Um, we did end up having a psychiatrist through Dell Children's, but because they are a teaching hospital, they, the residents, um, they, they transition annually. So for several years, we were getting a new psychiatrist, a new person, somebody having to relearn her story. And for Eileen, it was very much, uh, everybody leaves. She, she has attachment issues and trying to be vulnerable and be open with a mental health care provider um, to get the support that you need only for them to leave. And then you have to start over um, is, is re-traumatizing for her. And so after a couple of years of that, we had to find an outside psychiatrist and eventually we did. Um, but I think that that was a big part of the struggle too, is that we did not have continuity of care. And so we were unable to address her issues the way that she deserved. Um, she would then go the following year, same fall of 2019, we were hot, um, I guess before that, um, because of that hospitalization. And then a few months later, we learned what happened at school, um, her dad, her biological dad finally stepped in and said, what if she comes to live with me? And I, they've always had a very rocky relationship. While he's always been present, he hasn't been consistent. So I, I we presented it to Eileen and it was her choice. Do you want to live with mom? Do you want to live with dad? It would be a change of scenery. You wouldn't have to see this person anymore. Um, it's up to you. And ultimately she made the choice to, okay, I'm going to try. And so she did. Um, but that relationship just further strained with her and her dad, her and her stepmom, and led to another hospitalization fall of 2019. Um, and then pretty much after that, it kind of snowballed. Um, she, January of 2020, tried to overdose at school. So she was re-hospitalized again. Um, February, again, we tried a partial hospitalization program and they said, nope, she needs a higher level of care. We can't give her what she needs here. Um, so, and then they were not able to pursue the higher level of care. So we had to, again, here we are searching for another facility that would take her, take her insurance, take all, all, all those things. 
um, in the midst of that transition, we finally, I talked to, you know, I talked to Nydia a lot during this time about all of the issues that we were having. I knew that she had had the experience. Um, and thankfully through her, we were able to get a lot of resources. I was able to get a lot of support. I was able to figure out, okay, this is what I need to say. This is what I need to do. This is how I get the school to help me. This is how I get her providers to help me. Um, and I learned about yes waiver and we tried, um, at the time we were in Hayes County and I, and it was so hard. Like we call like, there was like, it was kind of vague. The instructions on the website were kind of vague on how to get started, what to do. There was like a number that you had to call and it was just a voicemail. So I like, I left a message. I probably left too many details. I was like, look, this is what's going on. Like I need help. I don't know what to do. Um, and I never heard anything back. So I kind of let it go. And then the next, until the next crisis happened and I was like, okay, hey, hello, like I need help. Like, what do I do? And then I finally, that second time got, got somebody to call me back. We kind of started that process, but there was a long wait list. Um, and that while we were waiting for services in Hayes County is when she moved to live with her dad and he lived in Bastrop County, which was served through Blue Bonnet Trails. Um, and with that move, services became available. Um, but the struggle there was that because she was living with her dad, he was now the primary caregiver. And so Blue Bonnet refused to deal with me. Like they didn't want to talk to me. They didn't want to listen to anything that I had to say. And I was like, I have been her primary parent for 15 years. Her dad has zero idea about what's going on. He doesn't believe what's going on. It was a parenting issue. And I'm going to take her because you clearly are not doing a good job as a mom. And so I was like, I, you have to talk to me. Like, so we got the runaround. Finally, with his permission, they were, they talked to me, I kind of gave them my experience and we were able to get somewhat started. Um, but because of the county that she was in and where she lived, they didn't have all the services. So they had a parent person that would come into the home once a week, um, the case manager to kind of talk to her, but there weren't really any other services. Um, after the January hospitalization, I was like, okay, clearly this isn't working. So she's going to move back home with me. So we brought her, we brought her back home. Um, and then it was back-to-back -back hospitalizations. Of course, this was also in the midst of right at the beginning of COVID. So now we have COVID interruptions. There's no school. Everything's virtual. Trying to access services. Everything's virtual. We don't have, you are not taking in-person services at this time. So it was such a, a struggle. Like there was no direction really about what, what was and wasn't allowed in person. Um, so we finally, um, in March, I've already forgotten again, March of 2020, like late, late, late March, early April, we got her into PHP that was still doing in person. So, but we live in Kyle. So we're way South. The only facility was up by the domain. So it was like an hour and a half drive. Um, thankfully, I guess uh, I, I do have COVID to think that because there was no traffic and everything was shut down and nobody was driving, it was like a 30 minute drive. So uh, that was probably uh, the silver lining, the blessing in disguise there that it was a, I was able to get her there um, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, she did that part program for uh, about a month, but then the same, they were like, Hey, she needs a higher level of care that we can't provide here. She's not making progress, like something like, and so they gave me a few options, but there was really no other direction. I was up to me to find a facility, somebody who would take our insurance to work through all of that. And then in May of 2020, we ended up in a residential facility and she stayed for about 45 days and then she came home. Um, by that time, everything had been situated with yes waiver for her to get services in Hayes County. So as soon as she was uh, dismissed from the hospital, um, we went through the step down. So we, she went from RTC, she did their PHP program, and then she did their outpatient program. And um, yes, waiver kind of helped finally stepped in with some services. Um, and then she ended up staying in the yes waiver program a lot longer than I think is what's typical, typically seen. She actually didn't graduate until April of this year. So she was in the yes waiver program probably almost three years. Um, wow. and even during that time, we had some turnover, like we had three different case managers. Um, and so it was again, hard, hard for her to, to, to trust, try hard for her to share her story, try hard for her to build connection and believe that this person cared enough to listen to her. Um, so once we finally got 
our last case manager who ended up sticking with her probably the last year and a half or so. Um, we finally started to see some changes. Um, again, I partnered um, be, because of the hospitalizations, she missed half the school year. Even, and even before COVID shut everything down, she had already missed a significant amount of school. And I was worried that trying to go into the next school year that she was going to struggle. And that was just going to exacerbate the problems, right? Like she's already a person that has difficulty with self-esteem. She already has is hard on herself when she can't catch up. She's hard on herself when she fails. How, how could I possibly throw her into the next school year and expect her to have any semblance of success? Like there was no way. I tried to get the school to hold her back. I was like, hey, can we repeat a grade level? Like, I just don't think she's ready. And they they refused. They basically said that everybody was getting passed because of COVID, regardless, even kids that didn't, never even signed on to Zoom were getting passed. It didn't matter um, that they didn't do any of the coursework there. Everybody's getting passed. So there is no, we can't, we can't hold her back. Um, so I talked to lots of different parents. I talked to different colleagues that I had at the time about what my options were. I was like, who do I talk to? Is this a superintendent issue? Do I go to the school board? Like, what do I do? Like, how do I, how do I get her the help that she needs? Um, and we were one of my co coworkers at the time had recently gone to work for the local charter school. And up until this point, I was very iffy. I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to put her in a charter school. Like I've heard, you know, all kinds of things. Um, but they did say that, Hey, well, you get to choose if you want her to enroll, uh, to repeat this grade, then you can do that. And it seemed like that was the only option for having her repeat so that she could get the, the, the guidance that she needed to be able to be successful the following year. And so that's what we did. Um, and I do think that for her, um, this ended up being a great change. The, they definitely have much smaller class sizes. Um, the guidance counselor was a personal friend of mine. So I was able to have somebody in the school have eyes on her at all time. And she knew somebody that she could go to if there was an is issue. And so I feel like we got a much higher level of support at the charter school than we had had at the public school. And, um, and she ended up thriving. Like, I, I also think that she was just not being challenged. Um, she's kind of one of those, I mean, she is a very bright student, but she's also, I'm going to do what it just enough to get by. So she wasn't taking honors classes. She wasn't taking pre-AP classes and she was absolutely bored, but she didn't recognize that. So the charter school only had a pre-AP track and an AP track. So she had no choice but to take those classes. But I think that that push really helped her and she was able to focus more. She was able to um, really succeed and thrive in that environment because she was being challenged to the point where she wasn't bored and she was finding new ways to do things. Um, so for her, it ended up being a really good option. Um, I will say that we did try to put Braxton in there because for me, it would be easier for me to have two kids at the same school instead of running back and forth. Uh, but unfortunately for him, it was not a good option. Um, they did not have the support services that they, that he needed. They didn't have any of the therapy programs. I think the only thing they had was adaptive PE. And I was like, no, no, he needs speech. He needs occupational therapy. He needs all, all of the other things. Um, so it didn't end up working out for him. So all that to say, like the charter school is it is a very individualized choice and it works for some kids. It's great for some kids and it's not great for others. For Braxton, it wasn't. Uh, Brooklyn is there now, again, thriving. She's first grade. She's reading chapter books. She's reading everything. You know, we let her play games every once in a while. She can keep up and read the directions. She can read her homework on her own. I don't have to sit there and read it to her. So she's amazing. Uh, again, it's great for her, um, but it is different for everybody. Um, I, Eileen still struggled the last couple of years, even at the charter school. But I think that with the supports that we had in place, we, they were really kind of like a fail safe for her. So even though she struggled, she had somebody there who knew what was going on. There were a couple of times that she, you know, said the right thing and here like, Oh, mom, we're calling MCOT. And I'm like, no, 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 no. 
that's not, that's not what's happening. Like that's not what she needs. Trust me. And so then it was the guiding counselor stepping in and saying, look, what's really going on. It's like, she's mad that mom said she couldn't do something. And so now she's going to throw everybody under the bus. And I'm like, I said, she couldn't go to do X, Y, Z. And now she's mad. And now everything that I've ever done is coming out. And now she's like, my mom's abusing me. I'm like, no, I'm really not. Um, so it's, you know, things like that, that, that happened during that time. Um, but we were able to get all of that under control. Um, oh, sorry, I don't know why that went away. Um, until I, I would say like the end of last year, um, we had issues. Her private counselor went on maternity leave. I don't know why this went out of focus. Sorry. Okay. But anyways, her private counselor went on maternity leave. Um, so she just had the support of her yes waiver team. And I thought that that would be enough, but um, we had some incidents at the end of the school year. And when I went in, the admin said, hey, like this has been like there. They said, you know, over the couple last couple of years, Eileen's name has come up a lot. Like she's always in the middle of the drama. She's always in the middle of something. There's something going on with her. Um, but this year they were like, her name has come up way more than, than normal. Um, and also in situations that were um, a lot more serious, like school vandalism, <laughs> you know, she was trying to stage a walkout because a teacher got fired. Um, so she's always always has kind of this social justice attitude, this self-advocate attitude, which is great. I love it. I'm like, love to see it, girl, but let's use it in the right ways. Like you can't just start a riot because somebody looked at you sideways. Like that's not how it works. Um, so trying to refocus that, redirect that um, for the good um, has definitely been a struggle as well. Uh, but at the end of the year, she was facing expulsion because she inadvertently um try I told gave someone the idea they found a bottle of paint and she inadvertently gave them the idea like oh you should go and spray paint all over the school because we're upset that our favorite teacher quit and um then of course that student was like what well, was Eileen's idea Eileen gave me the paint and she's like I just found like we just found it in the gym I it's not mine but again she was in trouble um and that's when they were telling me like, hey, like this year has just been really, this, this has been a, another level for her. These are just a lot of the issues that we're having. Basically, why should we allow her to stay here? And so we had to like, both of us promise like, hey, look, and I told him like, hey, I'm doing everything that I can. Um, you know, Eileen is too. She's been without the support of her primary counselor who's known her for years. Um, she does have the yes waiver team, but clearly um, that's not enough support. And so it was thankfully like two weeks before school ended. So they were like, look, we're going to ride it out for the, the next couple of weeks, but next year you're going to start the year on a behavior plan. We're going to do, you know, you're going to have a check-in with the, your check-in person is going to be the principal. So it's going to be, we're going to have eyes on you. We're going to keep you busy kind of a thing. Um, I will say that this year I, I was just recently stopped by one of the admin who was in that expulsion meeting. And they said, you know what? I just want you to know that um, Eileen's really turned things around this year. <laughs> well, um, she's a different kid. Like she is, um, she's taking on leadership roles. She is um, one of the people that we call when we need help with new students. Um, just... <laughs> And I'm just, you know, really proud of the progress that we made over the summer. We got back in with her primary counselor. She's struggling with like eating disorder. So we got her in with the nutritionist again. And um, like I said, she graduated from Yes Way Versa. So she doesn't have that additional support. But with um her primary counselor and everything, we've able we've been able to turn things around. And also I think that just with age, like she's just matured quite a bit. Um, so she's finally seeing the bigger picture. She's got uh, big dreams. She wants to, you know, go to college, all those things. So, um, and I mean, and she's always, she's always had dreams, but for a while there, like she didn't even, she didn't even see a future for herself when, when she was asked about it, it was very much like, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. I, my dreams are silly. I don't want to pursue that anymore. Um, and so now I think we're finally on the other side of the tunnel, right? Um, uh, 
Um, so I'm really, I'm looking forward to what else, what else is to come, but kind of the biggest thing, like throughout all of the struggles and throughout everything, like if I didn't have Nydia, if I didn't have other parents that had done this before me to tell me what to do, where to look, what the secret handshake was, like, I wouldn't have known what to do. I mean, I'm considering myself, I'm pretty tech savvy. Um, I'm all, also, a, I'm the tech savvy millennial. I'm the, <laughs> I'm the millennial that knows exactly what to do, where to go, how to find things. Um, and I could not find the resources. The resources were not easily accessible. They were not readily available. Trying to navigate the state websites to find what was out there was not easy. Trying to start the process of getting into Yes Way, where the process of finding counselors and psychiatrists and all the things like that wasn't, I, I didn't have enough support there. And I am, because of my experience with Braxton as well, I am constantly thinking about the parents who don't have what I have, that don't have an education, that don't have um, people that are supportive, that have been through it, that are in their life to tell them what to do. Um, you know, and we see like resource fairs and stuff like that. But first of all, I didn't even know I needed a resource fair. Like, why would I go? Like, I had no idea I was going to need mental health services. I had no idea I was going to need um, Medicaid services. I had no idea I was going to have a special needs child. So why none of that was beneficial to me. So I didn't seek it out. And then when I needed it, I was in crisis. I didn't have time to go to a resource fair. I was trying to keep my kid alive. I didn't have time to go seek out all of this information. Um, I, I think back to like our hospitalizations and even in the, that first, very first one, we talked to a social worker. She didn't tell me about Yes Waiver. She didn't tell me about other services that were available to us. You know, af upon each discharge, I was like, oh, she would really benefit from ongoing group therapy. Great. Where are the groups? They're in North Austin. They meet at five o'clock. I was like, sir, I live in Kyle. That's an hour and a half drive. And there's no way I can't pull her out of school to go to this meeting. And it's not that I'm not supportive. It's not that I don't want what's best for my kid. I physically cannot make this happen. I have two other kids that have therapies. I have a, I have two other kids that need to be in bed by seven o'clock and you want me to drive and rush hour traffic across Austin. Can't do it. Um, and there's just not any resources here where we are. Um, there's nothing in South Austin, nothing in Kyle, nothing in Buda, nothing in San Marcos. Like there's just a, there, there's a huge lack of resources available. And if there are, Again, I'm not finding them. And like I said, I'm a very resourceful person. So if those services exist, like I, I think that we need to find a better way to get that out. Like, why isn't this information in a pamphlet in the waiting room at the pediatrician's office or at the doctor's office? There's pamphlets for everything that people are reading. When I we had an emergency say we were in the emergency room for 24 hours before there was a bed that opened up for her. I read everything in that room. None of it was helpful to me. I didn't need to know about, you know, the flu vaccine again. Like there, uh, there's just such a missed opportunity, I think, for helping parents and getting resources out there for us. Um, and, you know, and I'm, I'm very grateful that I, that I have the life that I have. I'm very grateful that I have a comfortable life, that I have a, um, you know, that I have the opportunity to look and find these things, but it's just not, um, it's still not enough. Um, you know, we have great insurance. We live comfortably. Thankfully, Yes Waiver helped to supplement some of those co-pays and deductibles because that adds up very quickly. Um, but it's expensive. Um, even without even without Yes Waiver and trying to make it to to pay for co-pays and deductibles on our own, um, we're we're like I said, we're comfortable, <laughs> but that comfort runs out real quick <laughs> when uh when those um bills start to add up. So um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot more that I would have hoped to see. Um, I'm glad that, like I said, we're on the other side of that tunnel. I think that we can finally see the light. I still, uh, I don't know what it's like to not live in crisis. So I'm still always on edge. Like what's going to set her off today? Like, is this going to be, um, is, are we going to go back to where we were? Um, for now, we have a great relationship again. She's coming to me. She's talking to me. She's opening up to me. Um, she's trusting me again. Um, and I think that we can all finally breathe. Like I just spent years of 
of just being tired, like mentally, physically, emotionally burnt out, um, feeling like I was doing everything while also not doing enough um, and trying to be there, trying to support her, trying to support myself, trying to support my other kids, trying to, you know, maintain a household when my husband was gone. And so I was by myself with all three kids dealing with crisis and, you know, my own, my other son's special needs. Um, thankfully he has been pretty medically stable for several years. So I was able to redirect my attention to her, um, while putting off some of his things like they're like, we just resaw everybody, all of his specialists this summer. And they're like, yeah, we haven't seen you for two years. I was like, mm, sorry, <laughs> we were busy. Um, so, I mean, thankfully, so thankfully he was fine. Um, but there were a lot of things that had to be sacrificed um, for one kid or the other. And uh, and that's kind of the, the trade-off in parenthood, right? Like I know that all parents probably deal with that. There's one kid that always needs more from you than another. Um, so we're always trying to find out what we need to do. Um I don't know. I think, I don't know. I guess that's all. I, I can talk forever. And Nadia knows that she was like, you have 15 minutes. I was like, I don't think I can do that. Um, but yeah, but I, I'm happy to answer. I don't know um, questions or, or if there's anything that I needed to, to clarify, I'm happy to do that. I'll just say, thank that's you great. so much, Vanessa. You're talking. I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I guess I just really hadn't thought about that. I met her when she was so young, but yeah, that's about right. Um, yeah, it, it, and again, I think Vanessa's story just highlights, Vanessa is a very resourceful person all on her own. Um, she also does lots of other side gigs that she didn't even mention. I'm like, lady, how do you do all this? Um, and I think that that's what we talk about when in prepping for this conversation was, you know, she is tech savvy. She knows how to find stuff. She, I mean, all she does for Braxton and the people she knows and she, you know, and it was still hard to find um, all of the resources that are available. So um, just thank you so much for being here and I'll pass it over to Josette or Berlin if they have anything to add or if anyone has questions. Great. Thank you, Nydia. And congratulations, uh, Vanessa. Uh, is that right? Vanessa on being able to breathe now and showing <laughs> us a, a, a the story, tell us the story about your strength, your courage, and your determination to, to do what was needed to take care of your kids' needs. And also getting rid of that box, that box that confines us, where we always go to when we're looking for resources. Thank you for getting rid of that box and looking outside and looking into your environment and reaching out to services other, elsewhere in order to get what you need. So I, I wanna thank you for sharing that story. Uh, and, and I love Eileen. I love her spirit. <laughs> she, she has a wonderful spirit. And yeah, so sure. um, we're going to go ahead. I'm sure, you'll, I'm sure you'll see her again on the news or something. And hopefully it's for, for changing the world and not <laughs> something else. And I was sitting, sitting here wondering, where did she get that spirit from? When I listened to you talk, I'm like, okay, the apple don't fall far. <laughs> <from the thing." laughs> so She's great, 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 great story. So if anyone have any questions, please feel free to um, write it down in the chat or either uh, raise your hand and if someone can help me review those because I'm using my phone. If I hit chat, I'm gonna lose everybody's faces. <laughs> I have a question. One again, just thank you. I know I'm just one of many voices that are thanking you in the chat for sharing you know, your, your experience and your story. And I have to say that um, I am in awe at your persistence um, and your, it, it, again, just juggling so many multiple things. And I know that you are one of many. I also know that, you know, even looking like it seems as a success story, to, if you want to label it as such, but how hard it is, even when things work out, just how hard it is and how many hoops you have to jump through. Um, but I think my question more is maybe almost like for Nydia. Nydia, can you, because because Vanessa, when you mentioned that one of the things that really helped you um, was being connected to Nydia. Nydia, can you remind everybody, you know, what role do you play, let's say, in with Vanessa and other, um, other families? Sure. So I'm a certified family partner. I... Um... The eligibility to be a certified family partner in Texas is that you are a parent who has navigated child serving systems, um, in particular behavioral health systems on behalf of your own child. 
So um, I don't know if a lot of any of you know, but my son, he'll be 21 in November. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So we've been doing this with him since he was about um, right before he turned six years old. So we've been doing it a while. Um, interestingly, though, um, I met Vanessa through um, kind of a long story, but met her through um, partly an organization that supports families with um, rare and undiagnosed medical conditions. So she talked about Braxton. That's where I initially met her. Um, and, and I was brought in because my son was getting therapy from, from someone else who was part of that board. Um, and just in getting to know her, and, and I think that this is, when we were talking earlier with Dr. Harvey about um, continuum of care, system of care, we never know where we're going to run into families who just need this kind of support, who just need to know kind of where to go, you know, just in the beginning. So I met Vanessa and her wonderful daughter and family through this, what we think is a completely different organization. You know, what we have found is those kids and families also can have co-occurring mental health conditions, um, mostly because of their um, physical health, but that's where I met her. So um, we just kind of had a trusting relationship. And as things started to come up um, with Eileen, you know, we would just talk about it. So um, I wasn't formally her family partner. She was a friend of mine. But just having that shared lived experience um, hopefully was uh, helpful to her. Um, so that's but in general, my job is a certified family partner, um, first and foremost. Thank you. Yeah, it's a reminder how really the the services that are provided, family peer support services, and helping families navigate system, they're they're needed everywhere. I was going to say um, just to kind of add to that, um, this again highlights where we can have all the resources and all the resource fairs. I just got another email today. The fall seems to be resource fair season, um, but actually navigating that, like supporting Vanessa through media, they're not calling me back. I had to leave a weird, a number at this weird voicemail. And I was like, I know, I know it's hard, but that's the process. Actually, you know, just being there with someone while they navigate that um, is really important. And um, that peer support piece, um, which is what, again, part of the system of care and the initiative that we currently have that we're really trying to highlight is that peer support piece. I would like to add that Nidia was also really great at meeting me where I was at. Like she didn't throw all the information at me initially because I would have zoned out. Um, but and I think there's one thing that we connect with was um, the show Parenthood. Right. And if you've seen it, you know, that initially when they get their son's autism diagnosis, like they have like there's this like information overload. And I'm like, that's how it felt initially for uh, when I was talking to some people, but Nidia was very, it was very manageable, like chunks. Okay. This is what you need to do first. And okay. I did that. Okay. Here's what you need to do next. And it wasn't like, here's all the steps, do all the things. Um, she was very great at, at making sure that I, I was comfortable in, in not, uh, in walking with me, not doing it for me, but telling me what to do and walking with me through every step of the way. Um, and, and I do that in, in the, the nonprofit that she's talking about, um, I now serve on the board for, it's called You Are Our Hope. Um, and so I do a lot of that with parents who are navigating um, the healthcare system with a rare diagnosis and what to do and, and trying to, on their journey to diagnosis and finding what's going on with their child. Um, so, you know, I, I was already doing that in my own ways when I met Nydia and then find a, kind of like Nydia's approach helped me and, and has continued to help shape the way that I also help parents now. Um, with that, with the medical side of it. Um, and I, I've had a couple of parents that have come to me now for a mental health help. Like, hey, I shared a little bit of our struggle, like on our social media and stuff like that. And so I've had parents that have come back and said, hey, you know, my kid's really struggling. Where, where'd you go? What'd you do? What's, what's, what do I do? Um, so I've been able to kind of, you know, pay it back, pay it forward and, and help other families um, as well. Right. Well, thank you both. Uh, very inspiring story and the importance of, of peer support as well. So thank you both. I'm looking at the time. Do we want to go ahead and start the next one or do we want to do that after lunch?
Um, yeah, if we can go ahead and maybe get the CMH, the Children's Mental Health Update. Um, I think okay. Liz Pearson isn't available after lunch. And then we might be able to slip in Jay's update or his overview of family health services. Okay, so we want to get the, the we want to get Jay in next, did you say? Um, I'm kind of lost on my schedule. That's okay. If we can um, shift over to Liz Pearson and see if. Yes. Okay. Hi, well, hello there. So we go ahead and get the update from Liz. Go ahead, Liz. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, and and thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. Um, um, I just wanted to provide an update on the children's mental health team staffing. Um, we are we. I just want we did receive some additional positions through this uh, legislative session. So. Um, we are hiring currently for a multi-systemic therapy project lead, a relinquishment avoidance lead, which will work closely with our, our, our residential treatment center project coordinator, um, a youth crisis outreach team project lead. And then we are also um, in the process of hiring um, or refilling for our residential treatment center project coordinator, which was an ex existing position. Um, and in addition, um, we are going. We are in the process of doing interviews for our children's mental health manager position. So we will have another representative coming soon to this um, this meeting. But I wanted to make sure to see if you all could share um, the links. I will put them in the chat. I think a couple of the positions may close this week. Um, but if you can share with anyone that may be interested, we would really appreciate that. Um, that's all. I'll put it in the chat for you all to have. That's all I have from the children's mental health team. But I appreciate just the time to um, be able to give this update today. Okay, thank you, Liz. And did you say you would put that uh, that information in the chat as far as the uh, job opportunities? Yes, I can do that or email it to you to you all, whichever you prefer. With everyone you're you're comfortable with, will be fine. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that. Okay, so I, I think we will go ahead and move on to, I didn't ask, did anyone have any questions for Liz before she, she jumps off? And if not, we will go ahead and can we let Liz, okay. Uh, I guess we can go on for lunch now. And how long do we want to do the lunch, 30 minutes? Can you guys hear me? Hi, do we have time to get the overview of family health services from Jay Smith? Yeah, well, I think we can. We can do that and then break at one o'clock. I'm sorry, at okay. 12 o'clock. Okay, we can do that. So we can go ahead and get an overview of the family health services at HHSC. And we're going to have Jay Smith give us that information. Welcome, Jay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm a little bit discombobulated. Uh, I just came up, I, I'm not usually, I don't usually work up at the office. I usually work at home. And so I'm trying to get this information up on the screen. Um, Sherry, I had a handout. I, I was trying to drop it into the, um, into the, uh, the uh, chat and I'm unable to do that. So if it's okay, I'll just send it to you. Um, yes, I can I, drop it in the chat for you, absolutely. Okay. I send it to you right now. Okay, and then I'd also like to, I'm gonna see if I can, I'm used to, y'all, I'm used to working uh, with teams. So, but I will go ahead and uh, see if I can get this information up on the screen now. Uh, just a moment here, share screen. And this is what I just sent, um, Sherry. You should be able to see that now. It's an org chart. I can see it. Okay. And I'll talk about the org chart in just a moment. Um, bear with me, I'm almost there. Okay. So again, I'm Jay Smith and I am the uh, agency's Children's Health Strategy Manager. Uh, I've been in the position now for a few months. Um, I've been uh, with HHSC working, uh, managing the Office of Disability Prevention for Children. 
uh, for, for about five years now. And um, the so I've been along on the on the trip here with the uh, with the interagency reorganization uh, and opposite disability prevention for children, as you can see on the, towards the bottom of that org chart, uh, we're, uh, we're there under policy and strategy. And so we're part of the health, uh, Family Health Services Division. Uh, the goal of the uh, organization, and by the way, the, the Family Health Services, the internal reorg, uh, took place back in um, November of last, last year. And um, the, the purpose was to uh, reorganize to better reflect this uh, support, uh, the support and the work that we do while improving um, the way we carry out business. Uh, we wanted to establish a population-based model that, uh, to help us strengthen services and support to support the vulnerable um, populations, make it easier for clients to, to find services that they need. And we have uh, four goals within FHS, uh, healthy mothers having healthy babies, healthy children and youth growing into thriving adults, healthy families creating stronger communities and strong teams uh, supporting strong programs. So if we take a look here back to the org chart and what I did was, uh, hopefully Sherry was able to send that to you. It's in a, it's, I didn't put it in PDF because it kind of messed it up, messed up the formatting. So it's just in a regular Excel spreadsheet. Uh, if you, what you can do is if you're interested, you can click on any of these uh, programs and it will take you to the uh, program's webpage. I'm going to go ahead and show you the larger picture of our, where our division sits. And of course, HHSC being such a massive agency, this is just one piece of the pie. Uh, but as you can see under CS, CPSO, and for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, CPSO stands for Chief Program and Services Officer. Uh, Michelle Aletto, she is our CPSO. And under her, we have a, a myriad of, of programs, as you can see. Uh, more to the right, you, you can see Family Health Services. So now going back to um, the handout that was sent to you, I'll put it back up on the screen here. You can see that uh, under Family Health Services, we have ECI, Early Childhood Intervention, uh, the WIC program. We have Family Clinical Services, another uh, area, Family and, and Youth Support Services. We have uh, the Family Bonus Program under, under that. Uh, uh, some notable programs within that area, or program within that area, is you'll see Thriving Texas Family, that was renamed beginning of September 1st, it was alternatives to abortion and now it's thriving Texas families. Um, I'm, our area is the policy and strategy area towards the bottom. And as I mentioned before, uh, I've been with the Office of Disability Prevention for Children. I'm clicking on that and it's gonna take me to our landing page. But I just wanted to just briefly to just mention uh, ODPC uh, to you all so that you have an idea of the work that we do within FHS. So uh, we focus on children zero to 12 and their families. And we have four areas of focus. And the one I think that's most applicable to this committee is the um, uh, promoting of mental health wellness in children with IDDs. So that's, uh, that's one of our major focus areas. And we work not only with the agency's Office of Mental Health Coordination, uh, I believe there was one or two people here that uh, attend the uh, Austin Integral Cares um, uh, Kids Living Well uh, meetings a coalition, uh, but we uh, do a variety of things, including um, conducting monthly webinars. We have an annual conference virtual conference in March. Last year was attended by over 2,000 people. And we do have that mental health component that we do add to the um, to the conference and also the webinars as well. So that's a little bit about ODPC. Um, and here's, like I said, this is the layout of family health services. I One of my jobs as a children's health strategy uh, manager is to uh, really work with others to find out 
what not only the, uh, the successes are, but also uh, ga gaps in services so that we can address those gaps. And that's currently a project we're working on now. Uh, we, we started with uh, family health services and we um, are gonna be um, moving over to some of the other divisions as well. One uh, legislative uh, bill that's I think not notable uh, to talk about is uh, Senate Bill 24. And for those of you who are, um, aren't familiar with the uh, TD, uh, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services Division of Prevention and Early Intervention, they uh, have been around since the uh, 1980s uh, in some form or fashion, that division. And they really are into um, a lot of, a lot of a variety of prevention efforts uh, throughout the state. Their uh, per house, or pardon me, Senate Bill 24, that division is moving over to uh, family health services, transitioning over the next 12 months. And we'll be, um, we're currently working with them uh, to uh, make that as smooth of, smooth of a transition um, as we can. So that'll be, uh, I'm not sure exactly where they're going to fall within the division, but um, uh, that's uh, the plan is to have them move over to our area. And really, as many of you all may know, when it comes to uh, services, even though they're not uh, with a mental health agency, one of the, I know one of the programs that they offer is, it used to be the STAR program. Um, now it's the uh, uh, FACE program, family, uh, sorry, I can't think of the, the, the acronym, what, what it stands for, but it's uh, Project FACE. Anyways, they uh, focus on children six to, uh, I believe it's six now, to 17 at risk youth, at risk of uh, truancy, delinquency, abuse, and neglect issues. Um, abuse and neglect, neglect issues being a primary focus. And they also uh, focus on uh, homeless and runaway youth. And so that's uh, an interesting, um, that's gonna be really interesting to see how everything falls into place within, within the, uh, the division. So that being said, uh, hopefully showing you this, um, this what I have up on the screen now, this piece of the org chart will help kind of put things into perspective because I know it's, it's such a, we're such a massive agency and just knowing where, where things fit is a big issue. Does anybody have any questions regarding uh, any of the information that I've discussed right now? Um, uh, again, you can always click on the program to find out more information about the specific programs. I'm getting to know them myself. So, uh, but if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Hi, Jay. This is um, Josette. Oh, oh, I just wanted to quickly say um, thank you for thank you for this. Um, this is really helpful too. I think seeing the org chart and the listing of the different um, sort of areas within you know sort of your branch of the org chart. Um, and if I understand correctly, um, you are joining us. You will be joining us um, as a member. Is that correct? If, that, if, is, that is if correct. If we decide to let you play with us, um, but uh, again, I think it's I think it's great having um, the representation from you know sort of this area to help even inform our work. So I just wanted to say thank you for this because this has been helpful to me even understanding. I, I wasn't aware of of um, I think some of the rearranging or the renaming of some of these programs. Yes, and then, it's, uh, pardon. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and then I realized, I think before that I um, had cut, I believe it was Vera Lynn off. I don't know if anybody had any other questions or comments. And I was just going to thank, thank Jay for showing us that. And I saw a lot of different uh, parts of it that I didn't even know was included in, in, in your department. So great. That was good information to, to find out. And going back to you all being part of this uh, committee, uh, that is something we're going to take the time to do if no one have any questions is to vote in. Do we, do we want or do we want to welcome HS, HHSC into the committee? And we're gonna, do we still have a forum?
assuming that we do have a quorum, and I am sure that someone will tell us if we don't, um, but pending approved Pending confirmation that we have a quorum, I make a motion to um, add the Family Health Services um, office or unit within HHSC um, to member to be a member of CIBIS. Looks like we get a second. Looks like Lisette Galvan from Nami, Texas, has um, seconded the motion. So. Um, all in favor, if you could enter in your approval, or if you do not approve, enter it in the chat. Okay, I would say, um, again, just assuming that we have quorum and that the approvals have come in, um, I think we can remove, or I'm sorry, not remove. Um, <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Jay and the folks in there too, um, or to, to our group. Thank you so much. And then also, I'm thinking, Vera Lynn, given that I think our time we're a little bit after the top of the hour. So what do you think about giving mm -hmm. everybody 30 minutes for lunch? Um, and then if folks can return back here um, at 35 after the hour, um, we will we will hear our afternoon, we'll be discussing suicide prevention um, trends and activities. Great. Sound good? It sounds like a plan. Sounds okay. like a plan. Thank you, everybody. Welcome back, everybody who is just joining us. Um, hopefully you were able to stretch, get a little bit of nourishment, bathroom break, hydration. Um, I wanted to, oh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that um, I think Linda Litzinger from Texas Parent to Parent, um, I think put a question in the chat. Uh, Linda, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, you were inquiring about any slides that, that were shared. And I know that Dr. Courtney Harvey provided a few, a, a slide deck with an overview of the children's mental health um, plan that is under development. And so I trust that as part of our follow-up notes, um, we will have copies of those that will be shared. Um, I think they are helpful again, just giving an overview of that plan. Let's see, my, by the look of my computer's time, um, we are at, we should be right back at um, 11.35, um, I'm sorry, 12.35. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, um, this afternoon, we're gonna be taking a closer look at youth suicide. Um, I think we've, we've discussed this topic, I think within the past year or two before, um, however, knowing that I think some of their numbers are trending not in a good way, um, we thought it would be um, a good time to hear from um, our folks at the HHS's um, Suicide Prevention Unit who, unit who track data um, that is specific to suicide trends in Texas to come and you know, give us some uh, an update on the trends that we um, that we're seeing here in the state. And then follow up with hearing about some of the activities that are going on, not only within our state agencies to address suicide, um, but also looking at what um, with some of the exciting things that is going on within communities um, who are coming together to work to address suicide um, and some other collaborative efforts that are going on in the state. Um, so with that, I invite you to sit back as we um, hear, I think, believe from our first presenter, uh, presenters from HHSC's Suicide Prevention Coordination Office, um, Tammy Whippleman and Jennifer hausler Garing. Are you here, ladies? Yes. So, 
Okay, can we can we hand the floor off to you? Sure. Um, Tammy's going to speak first, and let me um, let me share my screen with the slides. Let me go to presentation. Well, thank you all for having us today. Um, Jen's going to share a slide deck. Uh, we figured it would be easier to see some information about data um, while looking at slides. But um, really what we want to do is just give you a brief overview of some of the um, statewide data on youth suicide in Texas, and then also give you a little bit of information, like Josette said, about some of the efforts that we have going on at the state office. Um, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, Jen, um, this is just an overview basically of what I said, um, what we'll be sharing today. Next, um, in case you all do not know, um, the State Suicide Prevention Office does have several positions. Um, we do have several individuals working on um, suicide prevention here at the state. So, um, I myself, Tammy Weppelin, I'm the Director of Suicide Prevention Policy and Services, um, joined today by Jennifer hoistler Gehring, the State Suicide Prevention Epidemiologist. Um, she does all things data for us. Um, we also have um, Jennifer Krutzinger. She's the Youth uh, Grant Project Director. She works on our Resilient Youth uh, Safer Environments RISE Grant, which we'll talk a little bit about uh, later. Um, Sam Zachary, who's the Suicide Care Coordinator, um, we'll also be talking about the Suicide Care Initiative a little bit. Um, Laura Hernandez-Gold, uh, who works um, part-time doing suicide prevention efforts and part-time on Project AWARE, um, uh, Advancing Wellness and Resiliency in Education. And then uh, Tara Reyna, she doesn't actually work under me uh, on the suicide prevention team, but she uh, is the Veteran Suicide Prevention Coordinator and does a lot of collaborating with our team. So we're a strong and mighty team here at the state. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you all had um, some reference of the people working on suicide prevention here at HHSC. And I will go ahead and let um, Jen talk some about the data. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Tammy. Um, we're going to start out by talking about hospitalizations for suicide attempts, um, specifically emergency department outpatient hospitalizations. Now, these are all hospitalizations where people went to the emergency department were treated and released. Um, if they were um, admitted to the hospital inpatient unit, they would be in a different data set. Um, but I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, the hospitalization for suicide attempt ED hospitalization, because there's some interesting things that came out. Um, there's only six years of data available for this data set. And you can see that there's a slight increase in 2018, and then it goes up and then it comes back down around 2019 and 2020. And then it starts to come back up again to, in 2021, back to the 2018 level. And so we took a little bit of a deeper look into this and broke it out by age groups. And you can see that just about every age group saw a decrease in 2021, except the zero to 17 year old age group. So you can see, and these are kind of strange age groups, I realize, but um, there's a suppression rule with um, the data that doesn't allow um, age, smaller age groupings if there are any diagnoses related to drugs, alcohol, or HIV AIDS. And about a third of suicide attempts involve um, some sort of drug um, diagnosis. Next, I wanted to talk about the suspected suicide attempt calls to poison control. So this is data that are available in real time, although I only have up through the beginning of 2023 on these slides. Um, these are calls received from EMS, emergency departments, doctor's offices, the general public, you name it. And they're coded by location of call, not the residence of the subject. So we're looking at statewide, statewide rates only. Now we're gonna look at calls concerning 13 to 19 year olds and six to 12 year olds by sex. So this is the six to 12 year olds um, suspected suicide calls to Texas Poison Control Network from 2005 to 2022. 
you can see that they start increasing around 2011 and then make a sharp increase in 2020 and 2021 and then start to come back down in 2022. And when we first looked at this data, I had hypothesized that this was related to school closures. And you'll see a similar pattern in the 13 to 19 year old girls, although it's not as stark. Um, but we also see this upward trend that kind of takes off in 2020 and 2021. Um, there's also an increase in calls concerning males, but it's much smaller. So it kind of gets dwarfed by the female rates. Um, like I said, we had hypothesized this was due to schools closing and students missing out on different services available at school and being socially isolated. However, when you look at the calls, the call volume on a month by month basis from the beginning of 2020 to um, the first quarter of 2023, you can see that the lowest number of calls come in during March and April and May of 2020 when the schools were actually closed. And you can see a pretty, a pretty regular rate of changes that when the schools are open, the numbers go up. When the schools close in December, the numbers go down. They go back up again in January and February, kind of hit the, sky, the high point in April and May when we're talking about final exams and star testing, and then come down again over the summer. And they pretty much follow this pattern um, through the rest of the, um, the time period. Now, um, suicide in Texas high school students, we're gonna look at the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is done by DSHS. It's a biennial survey of a random selection of classrooms and a random sample of Texas high schools. Um, and it monitors behavior that increased the likelihood of developing the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in adolescence and adulthood. We have five questions concerning suicidal behavior. And again, this is statewide data. So the first one is feeling sad or hopeless for two weeks or more such that they stop doing, taking part in their usual activities. And this is Texas versus the US. The US is in the dark blue, Texas is in the light blue. So you can see we're looking at close to half of students felt sad or hopeless for two weeks or more. And this was in the spring of 2021. And then seriously considered suicide, about one in five kids, a little more than that. And again, we have about one in five kiddos who made a plan about how to attempt suicide. And then we see the larger difference in attempted suicide where Texas is at 12.3% and the US is at 10.2%. So that's about one in eight high school students who made a suicide attempt in the previous 12 months. And then we can see it's a lower number of the percentage of students that um, required medical attention after a suicide attempt. Now this is, as I was saying, that students who attempted suicide in the past 12 months, looking at Texas and the US, you can see that prior to 2021, the US kind of went down and stayed about the same and didn't increase and then came up in 2021 but in 2019 and 2021, but Texas had a steady increase pretty much from when we started doing the survey in 20, 2001 up to 2021 and has stayed higher than the national rates. Now this is Texas high school students who attempted suicide in the past 12 months by self-identified sexual orientation. Heterosexual students are in blue, gay, lesbian, and bisexual students are in green. You can see that although there's some variation in the rates, it's pretty, pretty standard that the gay and lesbian and bisexual students are attempting suicide at about three times the rate of their heterosexual classmates. And now I'm gonna hand it back over to Tammy to talk about our efforts. Okay, um, hopefully y'all can hear me. My internet uh, went out and I think I'm back. Can you hear me, Jen? Yes. Okay, great. Um, awesome. So I'm just going to go through a couple of our uh, state efforts for suicide prevention, um, our suicide care initiative, our resilient youth safer environments grant and training and technical assistance uh, efforts that we have here at the state. Uh, next slide, Jen. 
So the Suicide Care Initiative is um, funded by Community Mental Health Services Block Grant, and uh, it has two main goals. One was uh, that we set up in 2019 uh, four regional suicide care support centers um, in the state to serve as training and technical assistance hubs for the other local mental health and behavioral health authorities in Texas to um, increase uh, suicide care and to increase training around suicide care for the local mental health and behavioral health authorities. And uh, this was to help create a more regional effort for suicide care um, rather than it being everybody in the state receiving the same training and technical assistance, it being more regionalized um, across the state. And um, the second goal of that initiative is um, for each of those regional suicide care uh, support centers to implement the zero suicide framework in their own local mental health authority so that they have um, a secure foundation for providing training and technical assistance to the other local mental health authorities. We've been working on this initiative um, since 2019, and we have a really strong foundation now for those regional suicide care support centers, and they have been providing a lot of training and technical assistance to um, all of the local mental health and behavioral health authorities across the state. So this um, initiative isn't youth specific, but it is um, suicide care specific and it does uh, go across the lifespan. So we're looking at suicide care from all different angles across um, from you know zero all the way up um, to older adults. Next slide. Uh, and then our youth specific um, suicide prevention grant that we're working on is um, Resilient Youth Safer Environments. This is a Garrett Lee Smith grant um, from SAMHSA that we've been working on also since 2019. And we're in our final year of this grant. And this uh, one is focused on youth ages 10 to 24 in um, the Galveston region. Uh, and we are working on setting up um, suicide, a suicide safer community uh, with different youth serving organizations speaking to each other, uh, more care transition between youth serving organizations, including schools, the local mental health authority, juvenile justice system, foster care, all of the different youth serving organizations coming together to develop strong uh, youth focused care transitions. So youth don't fall through those cracks that they often do in uh, suicide care. Next slide. Uh, and then one of our big pushes at the state is working on suicide prevention and intervention and postvention training. So our team will do the trainings listed here on the slide um, for other state agencies. We do them for community. We often uh, do these trainings at conferences uh, to ensure that folks in our community, uh, all Texans know that suicide prevention is um, everybody's role. Everybody has a role in suicide prevention and that um, suicides are preventable. Um, so we do ask about suicide to save a life. We do applied suicide intervention skills training. Um, we do safety planning intervention training, and we also have the ability to do training of trainers for suicide, uh, safety planning intervention. And then we also do local outreach to suicide survivors or loss team uh, training for volunteers. So um, we do travel to communities to provide um, loss team trainings. Um, we do the other, we do at, ask and safety planning intervention virtually to make it more accessible for um, communities as well. Next slide. And the last thing that I wanted to highlight was um, technical assistance. Um, so uh, whenever communities uh, need additional technical assistance on um, things that may be going on in their community, we can provide technical assistance with that. Um, Jen Hoisler-Gehring is uh, 
wonderful about providing technical assistance regarding data. Um, but one of the things that we have done in the last couple of years is working on providing technical assistance through these data one pagers um, and flyers and um, data two pagers, sorry, and the flyers that we've been creating. Um, so these specific flyers um, and many more like them are on our web page. Um, and this past year we created, we added seven of these flyers um, addressing different populations uh, that some of them not often thought about or often um, the, there's not a lot of information out there on how to address suicide prevention in some of these populations. Um, most notably, the one that we put out uh, this past year was um, suicide prevention for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we do have several youth focused ones as well. Um, so uh, technical assistance is something that um, we're, we spend a lot of time and focus on in our office as well. I'm not sure with the with the way the panel is set up, Josette, if you want us to take questions or if you want to do that at the end of the panel, but we're happy to do either. Hmm. I, I would say if anybody has, you know, one or two questions right now, um, for our your suicide prevention team, feel free to um, jump in the chat or to unmute yourself. Okay, if not, um, folks, there'll be a, we're following the rest of um, our other presenters. Um, we also will engage in dialogue and you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, so thank you all so much for, for sharing that information and reminding us um, not only of the, um, the prevalence and the trends that suicide is an issue among youth in Texas, even, even children that we don't necessarily think of, as being affected by suicide? And then also, what are some of the things that um, HHSC is doing to address suicide? Um, so thanks for staying with us, um, Team Suicide Prevention at HHSC, while we now go to Nicole Warren um, at Integral Care, which is the local mental health authority um, here within Austin and Travis County and the surrounding areas, um, to hear about um, some of the, or to hear, the perspectives of a a call center um, for where the folks call the suicide prevention lifeline. And so, Nicole, if you can um, unmute yourself, and the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much Thank for having you me. Thank you so much for having me. I am realizing that I, I am hearing realizing myself. that I so am I hearing am myself. Going, so I, I was having some audio going. issues. I was having some audio issues. So maybe mute either. Just mute maybe one of the devices you're on, and that hopefully will take care of it. There we go. How is that? Are you all hearing me? Yes, we hear you without the echo. You hear me without the echo. Fantastic. Yes. Okay, good. Also, <laughs> Thank you. One more um, technical. One Jennifer, if you could shop, or if you could, Jennifer Hausler Gehring, if you could stop sharing your screen. I can't find how I to do it. I'm not familiar sharing. with Zoom. Thank you. There you go, Nicole. Wonderful. All right. I am sharing my screen, but let me put it on the correct one and move that over there. Oh, you're getting a sneak peek. Don't look. <laughs> Um, and let me just make sure I get that to the um, presentation. There we go. Okay. So, um, thank you so much. Yes, my name is Nicole Warren. I am the practice administrator for the helpline that includes our 24 seven crisis line, our 988 line, and our appointment and intake lines as well. And just to make sure, what you all are seeing right now is one slide. You're not seeing the preview slide. Is that correct? I think so. Yes. yes. This one. 
Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so this is just a brief overview of what we'll be discussing. Um, of course, I'm, I'm probably gonna go through the initial slides fairly quickly because I really wanna focus on, um, of course, the youth crisis calls from the LMHA perspective and suicide prevention, why we're here today. Uh, so this is just the, the most recent information from the CDC data on um, uh, suicide deaths. And specifically looking at youth suicide, um, as we all know on this call, uh, suicide is the second leading cause of death and was and mentioned in the previous um, presentation, um, LGBTQ youth, um, youth of color, our black youth and our native and indigenous youth are really the youth that are needing additional support um, and additional resources. This is a brief overview of integral care. We are the local mental health authority for Travis County. And this is the most recent data that we have. This is fiscal year 22. Uh, we're working on um, getting together fiscal year 23. So you can see the breakdown in services there. And you can see, of course, our child and family services right there in the middle. And this is a heat map looking at the um, services that were provided um, where individuals are located uh, across Austin. And looking specifically at our youth services. So what services are we providing um, to our youth? Uh, case management, medications, individual therapy. And what's really great about this um, is that it can be clinic-based, community-based, or school-based. Um, and then, of course, there is our YES waiver program providing those wraparound services. And we very much like to take a no wrong door approach at integral care. So it doesn't matter where you enter. If you enter through our crisis door, if you enter through our clinic door, we will make sure that we get you to the right supports. And here are a lot of the crisis services we offer. And of course, youth are included in these. We have our 24-7 local crisis line, our 988 line, of which integral care covers 65 counties in Texas and our walk-in clinic, psychiatric emergency services. And there is an option, 911 plus four is what we're describing it as. So essentially, um, if somebody calls 911, they get police, fire, EMS, and mental health. And mental health is that key additional option where you um, could be connected with um, a counselor. And then, of course, our mobile crisis outreach teams, um, which regularly go out into the community, regularly go to schools. And there is a crisis respite and stabilization that is available for 18 plus. And here's a brief uh, timeline of the helpline at Integral Care. And you can see essentially the hotline has been around since Integral Care was established in 1967. And we became accredited by the American Association of Suicidology in 2008, and then started taking 988 calls back then called National Suicide Prevention Lifeline um, in 2012. And then um, 988 was rolled out officially in 2022. So we began expanding. Of course, we were taking more counties before then. And then um, the chat text expansion occurred this year. So we are the only um, LMHA in Texas right now answering chat and text lines for 988. And we were recently accredited by AAS for that piece as well. And this is just to give you a sense of what our call volume looks like. So last fiscal year, we took over 200,000 calls. So that was averaging about 14,500 calls per month. And in terms of crisis calls, that gray line at the top, we were averaging about 7,000 crisis calls a month. That includes our local crisis line and our 988 crisis or and our 988 line. And this is just an introduction to 988 for anyone who's not aware. It was officially rolled out last year. But as you saw from before, it was previously called the National Suicide Prevention Line. So it's been around for quite a while. And this is what happens when you call 988. So you will be met with multiple options. Um, I wanna draw your attention specifically to option three, which is for LGBTQI youth under 25, very important addition. Um, and um, it was initially run by the Trevor Project. 
Uh, there's also a new component for ASL as well. Um, and I am happy to put that link in the um, chat if that's useful. Essentially, you will be met with a um, interpreter that will come on um, when you go on to that link um, and um, you can get crisis support that way. There's also, if you text Ayuda, A-Y-U-D-A -E to 988, you will be able to connect um, for Spanish text crisis support. And this is an outline, this is a map of the, um, the, the groups that are answering calls for 988. So those red arrows are um, the bulk, uh, answering the bulk of the 988 calls. These are the local mental health authorities. So that includes Emergence and El Paso. MHMR of Tarrant in Fort Worth, um, us, Integral Care in Austin, and Harris Center in Houston. And um, of course, we have our Suicide and Crisis Center um, that helps out as well in Dallas. And then Blue Bonnet just was um, added to, um, they were subcontracting to provide state backup. So essentially what that means, if those calls are not answered in the first 30 to 60 seconds when somebody calls 988, it will go to that backup center and Blue Bonnet can capture those to ensure that all of those calls are answered in the state, which of course is the goal. Here are some highlights and impacts of 988. Um, Texas has the third highest call volume in the nation. And what is important is we also have the third highest answer rate in the nation. Um, and uh, initially it was challenging to keep up with that call volume because um, as you all know, Texas is very big. Um, and so 254 counties, which are all covered, um, but it did, it took some work to be able to answer all of those calls. So we have grown significantly um, at all of the uh, LMHAs. We have been able to add some staffing and we jumped from um, initially answering at a 30% rate to now 83% was our most recent data. Um, and this is because of increase in funding, allowing us to add more staff. And I know at Integral Care, it really helped us to have the remote option um, and the technology to be able to hire individuals um, in multiple areas. What ha happens when somebody calls in crisis? It's a very important question. Um, as you saw earlier, um, when you call 988, you could see what options were given, what you will hear um, before you get connected with somebody. When you call the local crisis line, the 512-472 helpline, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you will get an option to choose your language. And then after that, you if you press one or if you press nothing at all, you will get connected with one of our um, staff. And the individual who answers the phone, it's the same people who answer our local crisis line and our 988 line. They are called uh, qualified mental health professionals. And these are individuals who um, majority of them have um, bachelor's or master's degree. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little tickle in my throat. <clears> throat> um, bachelor's or master's degree who um, uh, in typically in sociology, psychology, social work, something in, um, in that area. Mm, excuse me. And um, uh, these are individuals who genuinely care. They genuinely care about the callers. They really want to hear from individuals. This is why they come to work. They receive um, robust training and there are supervisors available to them 24 seven. So there's going to be that non-judgmental support. They are there to listen. And that is what the majority of these calls involve. It's really just somebody wanting to be heard, um, somebody that is, is wanting somebody to listen to them. And so we always choose the, what's called the least restrictive environment, LRE. Um, and so, as I said, that's the majority of time. It's just going to be simply listening to calls. If somebody is interested in additional resources or supports, we can absolutely provide that. For example, if they're wanting information on PES, Psychiatric Emergency, emergency Services, our local clinic, or if they would like a dispatch to our mobile crisis outreach team, not a problem. We can absolutely make that happen. If we get a call from somebody outside of the Travis County area, not a problem. We know exactly how to get them connected um, to local supports as well. So grateful for that LMHA system, and we just get them connected. 
A question that we often get is, does the person in crisis have to be the caller? And the answer is no. Um, anybody can call, anybody. Uh, we get regular calls from schools, uh, community partners, family members, um, people just really concerned about other individuals. Um, and uh, we can provide that information and those resources and you can circle back to that person or if you would like us to reach out to that individual in crisis, we can absolutely do that too, not a problem. And a service that we provide um, that uh, individuals have found to be helpful is callbacks, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, we can check in with the person. We always get permission first. Uh, are you interested in receiving a call later on tonight, tomorrow, the following day, just to check back in, see how you're doing. Um, and if the individual agrees, then we give them a call back. And uh, a lot of times people have said that that has been helpful and um, research and data supports that as well. Here's some trends that you can see are text and chat trends. It's, it's on much smaller because it's definitely a pilot program for us. But as you can see, um, our youth prefer the text and chat over calls, which is not surprising. And I will say um, when looking at our youth interactions, looking at those trends, the majority of the calls that occur during the day um, are typically from schools requesting MCOT referrals, mobile crisis outreach team referrals, and they can go out to the school, they can go out um, into the home, whichever makes sense for that individual. It's, it's absolutely not a problem, they can do that. When we're connecting with our youth um, directly, that's typically on evening and overnight. And, um, as I said before, the Ooh, Nicole, it looks like you might be muted, or maybe it's just me who cannot hear. Yeah, Nicole is muted. Yes. I will try and uh, maybe direct message her. Let's see. Although I'm wondering, is it possible from somebody who is administering or is doing like sort of the backdoor part of, um... oh, thank you, Glenn. I see Glenn just sent a message too, or if we could unmute. Is it possible? Let's see. I know she had um, meant- That might involve the guard. Are you hearing me? Now we can, yes. Okay, sorry, my phone is doing something weird, but okay, thank you. <laughs> say, I apologize for Just go back for maybe like a minute and 30 seconds if you don't mind reviewing your talking points. Yes, not a problem, yes. And thank you for letting me know. So I'll just, I'll start at the top with this um, slide. Um, the majority of our calls during the day are for schools, uh, from schools requesting MCOT or mobile crisis outreach team referrals. And they can absolutely go into the community and they can um, uh, go into the community and they can also go to the school as well. Either is absolutely fine. When we're talking with the youth directly, that is typically on the evenings and overnights. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, the younger demographic typically prefers the text and chat over calling. Now, of course, um, trust, building rapport, these are things that occur on every single call. These are things that we focus on. These are things that we work on building. An additional question, when do we get LAR guardians and parents involved? Um, well, as I said before, really the majority of our calls, it's really just the individual, the caller, or they want someone to listen. And we can do that, no problem. Um, if they are wanting additional resources, we can also do that. Um, we will often encourage um, getting involved in um, uh, uh, getting involved in um, uh, safety plans, um, getting parents involved in safety plans. And, and of course, those very small percentages um, of calls, if there is any imminent or immediate risk, then of course we would um, uh, get guardians involved or we would get um, immediate services out to those um, youth um, if that's what's required. Because of course, safety is the most important thing. 
and looking at 988 um, in terms of getting that information out to youth. Um, I can tell you now that we have had our first um, year of 988 being rolled out, um, there's going to likely be a lot more advertising, um, more on social media. I am assuming this is going to be um, discussed a lot more um, now that it's um, officially rolled out. And um, I have heard things about 988 and crisis lines being on student IDs as well, which is fantastic. Um, that is just great. Just getting that information out there is so important. And, and finally, um, what are the biggest challenges in preventing youth suicide in Texas? What are the biggest opportunities Texas has to prevent youth suicide? Very important questions. Um, so I consulted with our team, um, the managers of the youth, uh, youth teams, and our suicide coalition chair. And this is kind of, this is what we um, came up with. Um, so whenever we're talking about um, any kind of public health issue like suicide, of course, we're talking about things around social determinants of health, um, addressing stigma, and really getting community to come together, because that's such an important piece of it. Um, how can we care for physical, or excuse me, mental health in the same way we care for physical health? This is so important. We all struggle at times. We all can experience crisis. So how can we come together and support individuals? It's a completely understandable and normal reaction if somebody is feeling sad, if somebody is withdrawing because they are are not, they don't have safe housing, if their neighborhoods are unsafe, if they're experiencing racism, discrimination, violence. Um, it's so important that, of course, our youth have access to education, um, nutritious food, um, physical activity, um, clean air and water, all of these things that the social determinants of health talk about. And Trevor Project um, and Out Youth are amazing organizations. I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on with my phone. It seems like I jumped out, but it seems like I'm back in. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, and so Trevor Project and Out Youth are great organizations that are doing wonderful things with their LGBTQ youth. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, Ask, Listen, Talk, Repeat is a great campaign, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? Um, education, asking these questions directly. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Um, asking about plan, intent, asking these questions directly. Um, there's a children's mental health tool toolkit, which is available. And um, I'm happy to provide a link to that. Um, this is from Integral Care. Um, I can put that in the chat if anyone is interested. And really that is focusing on signs, supports, and tools. Tools. And then there is the More Than Sad project, which um, focuses on signs and education. They describe it as how can we be smarter about mental health? And the piece I really liked about that is the peer support, because kids are talking to kids, you know, so how can we make sure that um, peers, they can, we can get that peer support there? Is that awareness? Like we all learn in mental health first aid, the importance of being aware, seeing the signs, asking the questions, bringing in adults um, when it's uh, when we need to, and safety plans, as I mentioned before, and then of course just bringing in more resources and supports. We know that that is needed all around. There are uh, wait lists um, everywhere, um, and really getting those services to schools, school-based services, so incredibly important because we know the youth are there. And those are the main pieces I wanted to uh, mention. I'm happy to be available for questions or comments now or whenever you would like me to be available for those. And uh, thank you so much for having me here and don't hesitate to reach out. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, and if anybody has any questions now, you know, specifically like some clarifying questions for Nicole, feel free to put it in the chat or to um, unmute yourself. And then... I think if not, if you could just hold on with us, Nicole, until we get through, I think, or just our, another final few as we're going through again, looking at what are some different initiatives or strat um, efforts that are taking place within the state to address suicide. Um, next, we are excited to have Terry Mabrito with us from the 
San Antonio Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness. And um, Terry will be talking about the Alamo Area Teen Suicide Prevention Coalition um, that she is involved with down there to hear about how her community is using a collaborative um, effort to address suicide specific to youth. Thank you, Josette, and um, thank you to all of you for having um, and you know setting this as an important part of your agenda today, and also to our state partners who have already um, done some presenting here, and to Nicole with 988. We certainly rely on the collaboration that we have with our state partners and certainly 988 as well to do our work. Um, so again, my name is Terry Mabrito. I'm a project director for the San Antonio Council on Alcohol and Drug Awareness, and I'm also the founding member and coordinator for the Alamo Area Teen Suicide Prevention Coalition, and I'm also a local co-chair um, with Jessette um, for the Texas Suicide um, Prevention Council Collab Ed Collaborative. Um, so, you know, all of us have gone through this common experience you know, of the pandemic. And um, the pandemic really did have a significant uh, impact on um, our local coalition work across the state. And I dare to say across the nation, um, you know, our local coalitions for suicide prevention are often very grassroots and largely unfunded. Um, so, you know, we had brief activities of, uh, brief times of activity um, where we, we had to just pause everything. We had uh, some of our coalitions like ours had a very lengthy time of inactivity. Um, our coalition is one, if not only the only solely youth focused uh, prevention coalition with a functioning teen ad advisory board. Um, we did maintain a group of young people who applied to be a part of our advisory board um, we they all had some level of exposure to uh, suicide, suicide loss, their own mental health challenges and crisis situations in their own lives. Um, they created a wonderful campaign called B141, and they were very active out in the community, spreading the word um, and in, you know, getting that message of being one for one uh, in their own communities and especially in their schools. However, you know, considering that reliance uh, on youth and schools, which is how we recruited our youth largely, you know, that did um, cause us to, again, have that pause of, of activity, particularly for the Youth Advisory Board. Um, so, and, you know, I think across our coalitions across Texas, I think you're going to hear, you, you would hear the similar kinds of challenges um, coming out of the pandemic. Um, and also some successes too. Um, but our executive committee uh, did continue to meet and with a you know particular goal of looking for uh, infrastructure support for our coalition. Again, we are largely unfunded uh, groups. Um, and then I continued to do what I could during the pandemic in terms of presentations and other activities as possible. Uh, and now we're really excited because we do have a new home. We have a new backbone agency that again is Cicada. Um, and they're really interested in focusing on the importance um, of understanding the intersection of mental health and substance abuse as it relates to suicide prevention. Um, and it's kind of interesting because on the substance use side, what I'm learning, and I'm, I'm new to that side of the work, um, is that often coalitions for substance use prevention are funded and may have a full-time or a part-time uh, paid staff. Now, it's not staffed necessarily well after that leadership or coordinator type position, but there is, uh, I do see more of that. Um, again, you know, most of our suicide prevention coalitions over many years have not been funded and are very grassroots. So our, prior, our priority now for the Alamo area is to strengthen, um, you know, our role as a convening entity. Uh, we're uh, conducting our first formal needs assessment. We'll also then subsequently be um, conducting our second strategic planning activity. We did the first one in 2015. Uh, and then, of course, the priority is to reconfigure how we engage youth. 
So uh, we also expect to support training in the community. Um, uh, some of what has already been mentioned, such as gatekeeper training, counseling on access to lethal means, safety planning, postvention, um, and of course, conduct the uh, many awareness and educational type presentations and get back to youth led events in our community as we had in the past. Um, we have a, a particular unique situation at Cicada in that uh, through Cicada's other substance use coalitions, we're able to link up with the five with five contiguous counties to Bear County to extend youth, uh, su uh, youth uh, prevention work, and that's through our ARPA dollars. And one example of what we'll be doing is that we will be using um, some movie events uh, using a mental health film series uh, across these counties to increase awareness um, and hopefully support youth suicide prevention. Um, we're really excited that we do have funding for our needs ass assessment. And we just had a fall kickoff where um, we're amazed and happy that we had 74 people in attendance. Um, and they represented um, almost all of the sectors that are indicated for effective coalition work. And I'll cover real quickly kind of who those some of those are with a few highlights. So of course we had schools and we were so excited that we had a superintendent attend our event. That is a first, to be honest. Um, we had, of course, diverse mental health and behavioral health youth serving agencies. We had first responders representative, particularly with a school-based um, law enforcement officer who was present. Um, we had public health in the room um, in Bear County. We have a unique situation where we have a longtime city public health department, but now also um, through some of the post-pandemic funding and ARPA dollars and such, uh, we also have a public health department um, on the county side. And um, also we had government leaders there or their staff, for instance, Senator Menendez sent a staff person. And of course, our county judge, Judge Sakai, opened our meeting with a call to action for participation. Um, we had media, we had KLRN, we had local advocacy such as David's Legacy, other, our uh, data partner um, for our needs assess, um, assessment work, which will be uh, community information now in Bear County. Um, we had zero suicide uh, leaders that come from larger entities like hospitals and our veteran serving um, entities. And we need work though on getting the rest of those important people um, you know, to our to our meetings and to the work that we're doing. And of course, the top of that list is always those with lived experience. And again, as we reconfigure that youth component, we will hopefully get that back in gear. Um, we need to work on the business sector, corporate sector, um, faith community. Um, we need to look at how we're working with pediatric and medical communities, family um, practitioners, nurses, and community health workers, kind of trying to tie this all together as a, a public health approach. Um, and so, you know, again, recruitment and, and then activities in the community um, is always a challenge. Um, but, you know, I think what we find is where there's an open door, we're going to try to collaborate. So, for instance, um, we are very fortunate in Bear County that we have an entity called the Mayor's Fitness Council. And I'll use this a little bit of as, as an example with a few points. Um, the Mayor's Fitness Council started as a fitness promotion um, advocacy type of organization. It's adjunct to the city. It is not a city department. Um, and it's not a 501c3 like most of our coalitions. Um, but they were very much focused on nutrition, fitness, and so forth. Um, early on, I became a part of one of their committees, and that has been a, a of an amazing uh, collaboration um, because of our presence around mental health and suicide prevention on the committees. And then um, later on their executive committee, which I now serve on, um, they changed their mission statement. They added mental health, socio-emotional wellness, that sort of thing in the language, both for the executive 
uh, uh, committee as well as the Healthy Schools Committee. Um, and this is bringing, you know, that's that door, you know, that door was open and they were a champion already for, you know, fitness. And we just helped them to expand that to the whole child, whole student um, to include mental health and suicide prevention. So that's kind of, that's, that is how things often work. And I'm not saying something you all don't already know, but it's where's that open door that we can relate um, suicide prevention to work that's already going on related uh, causes. Those could be things like, you know, violence prevention, safe environments, food insecurity, um, and certainly supporting academic and vocational um, success. Um, again, kind of back to how we can um, support those with lived experience in being a part of our work. Um, we certainly were successful with that in the past. And then, of course, we will definitely make that a continued focus. Um, the way we'll work towards uh, re-engaging youth is going to be, at this point, collaborate with other entities that also have a youth vo voice component or a youth leadership and development component. Um, we will certainly partner with schools and our education service center region 20 to also recruit youth to be a part of our work, but we want to also see how we can connect with other groups that are already meeting. The Mayor's Fitness Council is also an example of this. Um, they have a student ambassador program um, that has a small amount of funding to allow students to create wellness projects at their schools. And um, we are definitely partnering with those students. And I provide some of the training for the students as they apply to do projects. And we've seen the number of mental health projects, uh, uh, you know, just I think triple, honestly, over the last few years. So again, it's finding those open doors and not just adult champions, but also youth champions um, to work with around suicide prevention. Um, you know, what are the challenges that we see in our community? Uh, I, I just feel like, you know, I hear so much youth and young adults are feeling just the burden of the world. They're, you know, it's in real time, it's media, it's social media. Um, it, you know, they're, they're just so, um, so in tune with what's going on in the world compared to, for, for instance, when I was a young, you know, teenager. Um, and so, you know, racism, discrimination, trauma, losses of all kinds, even the losses through the pandemic, um, loss of the celebrations, loss of, loss of milestones, things like that, um, the political and social unrest that they are seeing and feeling, and yes, still stigma. You know, the pandemic has highlighted mental health, but there is still stigma. Um, this pervasiveness of sadness, I think, is just really critical. And then you think about the generation, um, these younger generations who are prioritizing happiness in their life, in their work. What do they want out of their career? Um, happiness is is very, very important to them. And so that's a real, you know, kind of um, difficult place to be so sad and yet prioritize uh, being happy. Um, again, um, what we see is, um, I think across the nation, but maybe even more so for Texas, is that um, access to guns is a huge challenge for our communities. Um, families also are still feeling very overwhelmed and may not even take care, uh, take advantage when free services like T-Chat, you know, is available to them. Um, again, we see so many changes in our own institutions, right? That loss of institutional knowledge, that's another big challenge. Um, so we're still um, going to need to educate youth and educate adult adults and, you know, kind of bring everybody together in this coalition work. Um, it's, it's not starting over, but it kind of feels like starting over. Um, again, back to the funding, we have very little funding uh, specifically for suicide prevention locally. Um, 
you know, it's part of the duties, other duties as assigned for, for me. Um, I don't do this work uh, full time. I do a, another couple of jobs with it, right? And most of you on this call are doing the same thing. Um, even if your role is not a, a paid person in a mental health type capacity, you're probably doing your other job. And now you're on this call with me and, and all of us today. Um, that's the way it is. Um, so unless there's a backbone agency that's going to champion the work um, and have the infrastructure to add to things like writing a grant to build up that funding for suicide prevention, um, you know, specific to that, or even just a part of their regular grant writing. Um, most of us are not 501c3s. So we're, you know, and even if we were, we'd be competing with all of the entities that are also writing uh, grants for their own particular causes. So um, those are some of the bigger uh, challenges. Some of the opportunities are that, yes, we are uh, working on a stronger linkage between uh, uh, substance use and uh, mental health and suicide prevention. Um, you know, it's great that we can Zoom. You know, I don't know that I would have been here today if we weren't able to Zoom. So that's a good thing. It's also a challenge because we need that in-person um, that in-person experience as well. Um, so um, the other thing that I, I have a sort of a, a, a conflict with, I'll say, is that celebrities are often, you know, nowadays talking about their mental health struggles. And we have some very prominent celebrities that youth may be aware of and look up to. So that's a good thing. I hope there's a time when I don't need a celebrity to get the messaging out there, but as it is now, it's it's good. That's a that's a good thing. Um, we have lots of ARPA funding, both through our city and county and Bear County, um, that funded schools and mental health and other types of service providers. So um, the good thing about that is that that is there. The difficulty of that is that they are knee deep, I'd say neck deep in implementation. So I have to really find ways to collaborate with those folks because they're very, very busy doing the good work of, you know, adding and implementing mental health services. Um, so, you know, I think that there are a lot of opportunities right now, maybe more opportunities than we've seen in a long, long time. Um, that's gonna help us because we still need to explore universal screening and of course reduce stigma, um, increase help seeking, um, educating our youth and supporting our students with peer-to-peer -peer support, uh, suicide prevention models. Um, because as it's already been said earlier, you know, our kids are gonna talk to uh, their friend most of the time before they ever go to a program on their campus or they talk to a, an adult. Uh, so we have a lot of our opportunities and um, a lot of work still to do. Oh my Thank goodness. you. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, I think you did a great job of really showing that even while we here within CIBIS and this subcommittee that is attached to you know state agencies and we often are looking at state policy is recognizing that there is so much that while the, yes, there is a definite role for our state's public systems to be involved in this in you know addressing the the suicide crisis across the age span. Um, but also knowing that there are things that can be done in the community level that y'all are doing and, and pulling those things together um, and try to coordinate and collaborate. Um, one of the things that I wanna do now before we, I know some questions are coming in in the chat, but I know our next presenter, Lisa Sullivan with the Texas Suicide Prevention Collaborative um, is up next and she has, she, we only have her for maybe, she only has a couple of minutes before she has to oh. jump on another thing. So if we could ask folks to, um, hold maybe some questions until maybe after Lisa. What we've invited Lisa here to do is to talk about um, a state plan for suicide prevention that has been developed that um, can be used to help guide not only um, our state agency efforts, but also um, community coalitions like uh, what 
um, Terry Mabrita was just discussing, um, as well as what our, you know, our, our, our businesses, our foundations, um, our higher ed institutions can do. And so this is, I think, a really important resource that can be used to help um, guide all of our efforts in addressing suicide. And so thank you so much, Lisa, for taking some time to join us and tell us about this plan. Wonderful. Well, before I do that, I just want to um, build on something that Terry said here a, min a minute ago and about how um, how far and wide these efforts reach to me, to reach youth in our state. I will share with you a story that occurred to us uh, or we were involved in about six months ago or eight months ago where we received an inquiry from Germany where a uh, Texas youth is was par part of lear learning German and as part of that, they were online um, uh, in practice groups in, in Germany. And this, this young person had expressed uh, suicidal ideation and, and the student in Germany was so worried about them that they tracked us down and we in turn tracked um, the local mental health authorities down to put, um, to put that that youth in con in contact with the help that that they needed, and so it doesn't stop at the Texas um, borders, if you will. This is really a far-reaching um, effort that that uh, we can sometimes have in 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 working to uh, help our 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 youth pr pr uh, get the help that they need, and so. With that in mind, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the Texas State Plan for Suicide Prevention and where that fits into the architecture of the, the uh, suicide prevention ecosystem in our state. Um, but before to do that, a little bit about the, the collaborative. Um, the Suicide Prevention Collaborative was formed in 2019 um, as a statewide nonprofit, as a um, and its primary role is to provide that stewardship of the Texas Suicide Prevention Council, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in a second. But our three areas as a, as a nonprofit really revolve around providing technical assistance to communities and statewide partners and, and military veteran uh, entities, as well as higher education institutions who are looking for that community first lens or looking through that community first lens for suicide prevention. And we promote the use of evidence-based practices. Um, what we find in this space is um, Google is not necessarily our friend in how to find the best resources and um, capabilities uh, to provide effective suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. And then, as I mentioned, um, our role is to administer the Suicide Prevention Council. So uh, I don't need to remind anyone on this call about the size of our state, um, but in order to address that, uh, in about 2001, a small group of, of communities, of about 10 communities that came together in a very ad hoc way, answered the call from the governor's office and the governor's tra uh, trauma advisory council to come together to architect the first Texas state plan for suicide prevention. And the mission of these 10 fledgling communities from across the state, and they were primarily lived experience um, participants, were to create, support, and empower Texas communities and to implement some of those community-based priorities that Terry has just mentioned, and to enlist those entities at that very localized level um, in their in their in their region, uh, advance suicide prevention awareness and education through local and state policy, and to support our state agency partners and and the important work that occurs to help. Um, move the suicide prevention uh, uh, conversation forward. The council, oops, hang on a second. I was trying to move my Zoom, really serves as a pipeline into local communities. So in order to reach these 254 counties, we have to have a mechanism uh, other than driving community to community. And, and so by, by creating these anchors inside local communities, we have this pipeline to not only drive information into the local community that's best practice and evidence-based and, and, um, and, and all of that, 
but it's also a pipeline out of that community that community to help identify what what our needs are uh, across the state and that fosters that community partnership and collaboration and so these 10 communities that came together in 2001 have now grown over to 140 entities across our state. And it's a mix of local coalitions, statewide partners. Many of your agencies are part of, of this process. Um, service member veteran and family in, uh, organizations, and then again, higher education um, institutions that work on this important work. And the council sort of has these four or five main areas of focus. And so all of our work with those entities really revolve around um, collaboration and capacity building, driving outreach, helping coalitions form and sustain, as Terry mentioned, um, local, local suicide prevention funds, um, rarely exist. And that is probably the number one um, call that we get from local coalitions is how, how can we fundraise? How can we find the funds we need to do this important prevention work? Um, and then also to offer training and the, and the suicide prevention symposium falls under the responsibilities of the Texas Suicide Prevention Council. But all of that work is driven by the development and the implementation of the Texas State Plan for Suicide Prevention. Um, in the handout that I will uh, provide for distribution goes through a timeline of the council. I don't want to take the time to kind of walk through all the key highlights, but I will say that the council uh, has a very long and proud history of contributions to the state on um, suicide prevention and the important work that it's done. Um, and this will be in part of your handouts from the meetings uh, today. And as I mentioned, we're roughly at about 140 statewide and local coalition partners. Um, the collaborative trains about 30,000 Texans annually on basic suicide prevention skills through an online training platform that we offer free of charge. And in addition to that, through, through grants that do um, come into the state, we run a very significant trainer of trainer network. So we know that we're building local uh, sustainability inside um, these communities for suicide prevention gatekeeper training, as well as counseling on access to lethal means among other, other protocols. And that network is about 500 workshop leaders strong right now. Um, to collectively throughout this process, we've trained probably, it uh, looks like about 17,000 community members and have distributed since the start of the council over 1 million resources specifically directed to community-based suicide prevention. So a little bit about the state plan. And as I mentioned, the first state plan was created in 2001. And it follows the comprehensive approach to suicide prevention outlined by the national strategy. And the idea here is the closer we can link to the core elements that have been identified as best practice, the more likely we are going to see success of our efforts. And so in this uh, comprehensive approach, you can see these, these core strategies that, are, that run the continuum of care from, from identification and assisting to encouraging increasing help seeking behavior, to making those connections to effective care and treatment like Nicole was talking about in those transitions, um, improving connectedness as Terry was talking about in those life skills and resiliency, um, putting time and distance between someone at risk of suicide, um, responding to those crisis calls, and then ultimately post tension. So this framework is always in the back of our minds as we begin to uh, update and administer the, the state plan for suicide prevention. As I mentioned, the first plan was developed in 2001 and that plan was recognized by the Texas House Human, Texas Human Services Interim Committee back in 2002. 
And we have done updates in 2006, 8, 11, 14, 18, and, and uh, uh, now 2022 20, for the 2023 to 2028 uh, timeframe. And our purpose in the plan is to be sure that we're coordinating across partners in both public sector and private sector. We have 254 counties. We cover 160 million acres. 130 million of those are classified as rural. If we don't work together with the resources we have, and if we don't coordinate together, we are not going to be effective in, in meeting the needs of Texans who need, who need support. Um, my favorite saying is, it, we're not Rhode Island. We can't get everybody into a room in 45 minute drive or, or, or what have you. We have a vast, vast geography and um, cultural competency and urban and rural and, and a ton of things go into making sure that we try to work together and to find those points of leverage to affect change over time. The plan also serves as a guidepost. So the local coalitions in particular can utilize this plan to help develop and guide their local planning processes so that they know what they're doing aligns with the efforts that are coming from the national and state level. And that way they can maximize the resources that are being allocated in that, that region. And then finally, it's a communications tool. It helps us inform um, those interested stakeholders of what what are the priorities that are currently being worked on? Where are the gaps that we need additional resources and energy behind? Because an issue may have been identified as priority, but we don't have a lot of activity in that area. So think of it as like an air traffic control system of where we're trying to help our state navigate across the various domains. And again, in addition to the, the um, comprehensive approach to suicide prevention, we also work to make sure that this plan is aligned with our key federal partners from the Department of Defense, the VA, the Centers for Disease Control, SAMHSA, and the National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. It, it makes no sense to develop a plan or develop activity where there are no resources being invested. So this is a comprehensive approach that the council's executive committee undertakes um, for its updates to really use feedback coming from the local levels and our statewide higher education and um, uh, uh, military veteran partners to really help inform what makes the most sense. Thank you. Oh, hey. Great timing. We had this planning process that we un unfolded in 2022, and it started with uh, identification of needs and priorities, and this was the council survey that goes out. Um, we look at national data and state data through, with the help of Jennifer hausler Garing, the 3980 report, and really looked at kind of where, where the data was telling us um, to spend, uh, to, to pay attention to. And then we crosswalked that all with the National Action Alliance's actions and strategy goals, and then began to develop some uh, practices um, and strategies for, for us to work on. And what, what that came about is we really took a cross-sectional approach to this. So we, 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 we began by collecting all the information and then began to look where those thematic themes were coming from. And what we found is we had six or seven areas that really stood out as being important in this next generation of the state plan. The first is capacity building. The system is under un, underdeveloped, right? We know local coalitions um, need support, they need guidance, they need um, uh, uh, act, uh, support in the development of their technical skill of in those resources that they um, are needing. We also know that our workforce needs capacity. And so the council's executive committee really wanted to emphasize 
the importance of being sure that we have a well-trained and sufficient workforce to work across the spectrum of suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. A key area that's of focus, and this was, we were at a presentation on Monday, um, uh, Hannah Vasquez, our policy fellow, did a mentee poll, and the number one thing that child care administrators would, if they had one dollar to spend, where they would want to spend it is in communication and outreach and helping to reduce that stigma and change the conversation to increase that help-seeking behavior. Um, research. So research in Texas is going strong, but we, but in previous plans, it had never been elevated to an action item in the state plan for suicide prevention. It's very prevalent at the national strategy, but we need to leverage not only what's coming out of the national research, but, but to nurture and grow that research that is in our state and those resources and researchers that are in our state doing important work. And how does that in, uh, um, impact our prevention, intervention and postvention potential? And another key piece of this is data. Working together to develop and nurture and grow data, data support systems so that we can rely on um, uh, uh, the best quality data and the most real-time data we can get our hands on. And you see the benefit of that through Jennifer and Tammy's uh, conversation this morning. And then another area that the, that the executive committee really wanted to bring some light to is the area of postvention. Um, oh, post oh, oh. That, um, is that, is that, 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 or is that somebody else have their, hopefully we're okay. Um, postvention is an area that is also um, relatively underdeveloped and how can we bring attention and, and, and laser focus um, time, energy, and treasure on developing um, a broader set of postvention uh, efforts? And we will drop this in the chat as well, but this is a, a, a quick sample of some of the things that the council identified as um, uh, key infrastructure considerations that they would, that they would like to see uh, addressed. And again, this, you can see it's out of sequential number. We pulled some key areas that might be of particular importance. And even some of these things that maybe might not look quite so uh, directly connected, such as CB 6.0, which is the broadband expansion. Um, I was in Terlingua about a year ago, and they're like, you know, all these online resources are great, but it's, uh, it's rare that we have internet, uh, except for good days. So we need to be sure that we can, um, and on the systems we're relying on, that they are available to especially our communities that are most vulnerable or um, uh, 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 need, our, need our support. Uh, the mental health workforce, we're looking at expanding the role of and capacity, for instance, of peer support and warm lines. This is all work that is coming out of work groups across these partners. Uh, how can we embed peers into crisis lines for warm line duty? All of these conversations happen in the council and with the council partners. Communication and outreach. This is an area that I think if we can all with relatively limited resources really um, take a little bit of time and energy to think through um, outreach strategies. So we're all saying fairly consistent things that, that will mean our reach goes even that much further. The council takes a lead in that work, especially during Suicide Prevention Month, um, and uh, uh, leveraging some of the resources that have been made available through the um, transition to 988, which involved a great deal of media attention and, and work as well and then to support the expansion of local coalition capacity to help do media training, to increase that safe messaging, to help with help seeking behavior. Um, some of the research, we wanna be sure that we're communicating the research that's going on across our state and how can we improve some environmental scanning and research of federal, national and international research initiatives. Uh, 
participating and in, in sharing clinical trials. These things create hope and help and healing and recovery. And if we can um, share that message, we're really um, moving the whole conversation for, forward. And then to one of the areas they wanted to focus in on is to, can we help guide where researchers focus for their 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 grant writing and research activities on things that help support the the improvement of suicide prevention and intervention in our state data we all know data is um, a challenge especially in our rural communities or in areas where data might be suppressed for privacy reasons so we've got to get creative in how we can work together um, and improve meaningful data sharing and, and participation in some of these key um, surveys, such as the YRBSS and some of these other school climate surveys, and how can we grow some of the data infrastructure to support a greater understanding. And then postvention, we wanna be sure that every community is equipped with comprehensive postvention planning. That's different than what you do to support someone after a loss by suicide in that, in that um, kind of case by case basis. But what can we do to be sure our communities are have the best um, capacity to support in the event of a loss to help um, uh, reduce the, the potential risk of a contagion or cluster event and, and keep that community, our arms around that community as it, it goes through the healing process. And this is even just communicating how work our workplaces should all have a suicide prevent postvention plan in place on, and this is different than a crisis plan. What we hear talking to schools in particular, that when you ask them if, if they have a suicide prevention plan, oftentimes the answer is yes. It's And it's really what they're talking about is their crisis plan. Um, postvention, we know, and Tammy Weppelman can speak much more eloquently to this than I can, is um, uh, is is a long-term process, oftentimes encompassing a year or more. We want to be sure communities and our our um, operating environments are equipped with with a, the practical realization of what some of those things may be that we can do to help keep our workplaces and our communities um, uh, safe. And we are right now developing a comprehensive post postvention planning guide for communities. Um, so that is sort of the big picture architecture of the state plan. Um, it is scheduled right now for 2023 to 2028. Um, work is ongoing to collect everyone's activities about what they're doing. We know we're not going to collect everyone, but it does give us a chance to kind of look and see sort of where are the, the gaps of where things have been identified as important, but there might not be activity there yet. So we can direct some guidance on grant writing and um, uh, resource allocation as time allows. So I will stop there and turn this back to Josette. Oh, thank you so much, Lisa. And I know that you have to run. So I appreciate you like squeezing us in. Um, and I will also say, um, even though Lisa is leaving us, as she mentioned, um, both myself and Terry Mabrito, who spoke from um, um, from San Antonio, we, um, Terry and I do serve as co-chairs for the Texas Suicide Prevention Council. And again, that is that the council that really is comprised of um, both, you know, organizations across the state, local organizations, um, statewide organizations, um, colleges, university, really anybody who's doing work in some way, shape or form related to suicide prevention is invited you know, to become a member of this council, which is used to really help sort of inform, coordinate and collaborate and build out, um, you know, really sort of like this infrastructure that we have to get evidence-based practices down on the ground where they're needed. Um, with that, I will say we, I think we have about 15 more minutes. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we have about 15 more minutes before I think we need to move on to the next agenda item. 
Um, what I wanted to do though, is cause I know we've heard a lot, you know, from, you know, we've heard a lot of information about data, about some of the state infrastructure on addressing suicide prevention and you know, some of the things that are happening in communities. I wanted to add one little more piece just to um, sort of complete the picture about um, some other resources that are available in Texas um, that both you, both, as a CIBIS member or stakeholder, um, you know, that can be resources for you to guide your own work um, in whatever way, shape or form it addresses um, mental health of children and families. Um, but then also thinking about remembering, going back to the core of why we're here. I mean, we're here as an advisory body. And so what I'm hoping too is that um, we'll have some time in the next 15 minutes is to think about what are some of those things that we should consider based on what we've heard um, you know, across our, our range of speakers today um, that can help, like what is our, our role in helping to address suicide prevention? Um, real briefly, I just wanted to say the only other piece that I wanted um, to say is that the, the Statewide Behavioral Health Coordinating Council, which is I think most people know or they're familiar with Dr. Harvey who joined us in the beginning, she heads that council. There is actually a suicide prevention subcommittee um, that to that council to that is used to inform the work of that coordinating council. It involves all the state agencies related to suicide prevention. Um, and I'm the chair of that work group along with some other folks that are involved with suicide prevention. And really what we do is the, the function of that subcommittee is to look at the data um, that is available and then use that data to make recommendations on how the state can focus um, or some recommendations and considerations for the state agencies on using um, on, on their role and opportunities to address suicide and reduce suicide in Texas. Um, just a little brief, I'm happy to share information about that um, to anybody who wants some more information, but I would like to use the next 15 minutes or so that we have to one, answer any questions um, or ask any questions of any of the speakers who are still on with us. And again, really hear your all thoughts about um, what can we as the counts, um, the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Subcommittee, um, what can we do um, to help you know, address youth's suicide among youth, um, as well as what are some considerations that we want partners that are involved in this work to um, have on their mind as they are doing their work. So with that, I invite, and if, if somebody wouldn't mind, I know I haven't been great about keeping up with the chats, but if you could unmute yourself and then maybe feel free to ask a question specific to one of our speakers, or even if you have a, just a general statement, let us know that um, um, as you're talking with us. There's a question from Stephen Cole. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Stephen. Hi. Um, sorry, I was. It, for me, there's a lot to process in what what all was shared today because I I help a lot of people out here in the rural area in Northeast Texas especially kids and I'm trying not to cry as I talk so I do apologize um because I am an autistic adult I have an autistic son and I also have to deal with my son not liking to be autistic because of how people pick on him and that's not even in a public school that's just walking into a store because of the way he talks or because he's stimming and he's wanting to dance or having a headset on. And I was recently talking with a parent um, here because I'm a part of the Texas Parent to Parent as well. And where she had to write an entire like essay because the school here, her kid had his headset taken away in high school. Even though it's a part of his 504. And oh, time and time again, we get, keep getting told to reach out to all these services that y'all are talking about, and we reach out to them, but where we live, the providers aren't here. We're, we feel stuck. And then when we tried to get people held accountable, 
which I've re reached out to some of the high ups in health and human services myself. And I have uh, proof of ADA violations from my county. There was a settlement agreement back in 2011 for Upshur County where, and there are ADA violations that were never done. And I have proof of all of that. I have a letter from the local police department where they reach out to mental health services like Community Health Corps, uh, Health and Human Services, uh, Adult Protective Services, Child Protective Services, veterans, so on and so on. And they're not getting help. Like, they're getting paid to be there to answer those calls, but they're not even answering the police calls. So if they're not answering police calls, you can only expect what us civilians are having to deal with. So, like, all of the stuff I was hearing today is beautiful and amazing. But I don't see it here. We just get told to call a phone number, and once the phone call ends, it, I'm, it's silence. Unless you you're lucky enough to find a group, and if you come from a different belief system, there's that whole aspect of that part, too. So the So, depending on the culture you come from, depending on the type of me the mental uh, struggle you're dealing with. And then if you're in a community that doesn't really have any information on it, you're, you're stuck. I work, so many people out here don't know who Texas parent to parent is. They didn't know about, I didn't know about the governor's committee for people with uh, developmental disabilities until back in July, I think. July. I've lived here for 12 years. I didn't find out until this year, July. I didn't find out about this group until yesterday. And I've been a part of Parent to Parent for two years, and I'm still learning about these things. And I researched, like, um, um, what's her name? The, the one that gave her experience today. Everything she said struck me hard because parent after parent after parent kid after kid I have worked with in the last 12 years being there for them being a support for them are all saying pretty much the same thing they are these programs in quotation marks that are supposed to be helping yet they're not and how do we hold them accountable they're getting all this grant money but they're not doing what they say say they are they're doing the absolute bare minimum what can we do about that in my opinion I would love to see a bill get pushed to where people are held accountable. Make it a law. If this is what you represent, you need to be held accountable. Because otherwise, you're hurting people. You're hurting more people than helping. I'm sorry. I, I could keep rambling. I don't want to. <laughs> no, no. And I want to just say thank you so much. Even though you just learned about this group um, yesterday, I'm so glad that you're here because I think your engagement has been very um, insightful, full, and valuable to these conversations. And so thank you um, again for being here and for contributing and sharing. What I will say is um, as somebody who has sort of worked within this sort of this policy space about, you know, with the goal of improving um, access to mental health services for kids and their families, um, Unfortunately, what you're describing is something that I think we've all been hearing from or hearing of. Um, and, and and saying that is some of the, I would just almost like want to add some of, I think what we've been hearing about maybe even just the, the, the minimum or the overview either of programs that um, are administered by the state to address some of these issues, um, as well as I would say even the goals of this committee in our work, some of them are aspirational. First of all, and this is a point that I think is really important, that even when we hear about programs and strategies um, within this space that are available, they are often available just in some communities. Some are statewide, but I think as we're hearing again, they don't look the same um, or they are not reaching everybody that um, could benefit from them or maybe entitled to them. Again, there, there is this far range. 
um, or this wide range of av availability and access. And so I think what you were just sharing, um, Mr. Cole, is I think just even another example and a reminder to all of us that when we hear about lack of access or workforce shortages or the churning of people who are delivering the programs and services resulting in those like disrupted relationships and having, you know, our kids and our families having to tell the stories over and over again, you know, how this is, you know, this isn't helping us to meet, I think our goal that kids and families have access to the quality services that they need when they need them. Um, so I know I don't have an, like really an answer to, you know, about um, what you think you were saying, Stefan. Um, I think it's, I think it's just acknowledging, yes, the truth in what you're saying and how we as a collective in our role as subcommittee um, that advises the Behavioral Health Advisory Council and the state system of care work. Again, there is still work that needs to be done. Um, I apologize, I was rambling there for a little bit too. Um, but what I wanted to know, again, just looking at the time, um, is there, did anybody else have any like sort of thoughts or comments to share, um, you know, maybe even specific about what, like related to the suicide prevention piece. Um, and I get, I know we don't really have time and we didn't have time this this month to break up into work groups, which I know, or like the little sub rooms, um, which is super helpful in getting feedback, but I would love to hear folks thoughts either um, if you take yourself off mute or put them in the chat about, you know, what are some areas that we, you know, could consider contributing to the state suicide prevention efforts? Um, I was just going to add, um, just listening to all of people's personal experience today, um, it sounds like it would be helpful to hear to like have a little bit more of like community engagement and here where parents who live um, in rural regions who don't necessarily have access to these services, I would wanna know where are they reaching out to um, so that you can then plan like um, to whoever they are reaching out to. Like I think in these more populous cities, we have people reaching out to a medical provider, their pediatrician, um, as someone mentioned earlier, like they sometimes a child will have to be hospitalized, but if, yeah, I, sorry, now I'm starting to ramble, but like, if those services aren't available, who are parents reaching out to and how, how do we connect with those people that they are reaching out to, to let them know what's available and whatnot? Um, I know I started to ramble, so I hope that makes sense, but. Um... Keep rambling, Julie, I get you. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things that I think too, is this just leads me back to our our top, um, one of our top agenda items where we know that this, that HHSC is charged with developing a children's mental health plan. Um, and I think all the points that we sort of talked about, you know, um, I think we as a, one, Thank you for those that have um, offered to, you know, serve serve as an ad hoc group to help inform that. But I think a lot of these, or I think all of these pieces that have sort of come up today, as with the feedback that we can provide um, to HHSC as it develops that plan. Um, again, that yes, we know there is this basic level of services that should be provided um, everywhere, and we know that they are not there or they're just there in some spots. Um, what I would wanna say, and a great suggestion, Julie, to think about, you know, again, how can we get to where, if people aren't coming to the normal channels or they're not getting information through the normal channels, um, it shouldn't be incumbent upon them, well, they should just know where to look. Because <laughs> again, as it was said earlier today, um, there might be a resource fair, but if you're not in crisis or you might not even know you need those resources or what resources you might need, um, we need to find a better way and think creatively about how we can get the information to where parents are and then also give them the information that they need, not necessarily drinking from a fire hose, which is I think what we've all done a little bit today, I will say. Um, one more thing, cause I know again, we're probably bumping up on time, um, but I see that 
Stefan, I know you, that you have your hand up, um, speak again. Um, so I would just say if you could, you know, briefly come and, you know, share something more and then so we can get through the rest of the agenda. And I believe you're also um, on deck to provide some public comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, the suicide thing specifically, I was going to say this earlier. One of the things I realized is one of the biggest issues that I've heard from kids over and over again is the current issue of our economy. They're absolutely terrified of what to do. They're dealing with a lot of older people that says that everything's easy, everything's affordable, just go get your own house. There is so much stress on our younger generation that that seems to be forgotten when the topic of suicide gets brought up. And I just wanted to make sure that that's always included. Yeah. I would like to weigh in on that. We had a presentation as part of our symposium learning intensive series last week by Dr. Sarah Wakefield out at Texas Tech University. Um, I will take as an action item, um, Stefan, to get you a link to her presentation because that topic came up as part of her conversation, both the, the economics, uh, the economic climate, as well as climate change. And she had some really great um, conversation about, about that. So that might be something for you to take a peek at. Yeah, and thank you, Lisa and Stefan. Yes, you know, I listed a few things that, you know, that that those burdens of the world today, and I did not list um, economics um, or, you know, um, literally how we make a living and make it, you know, with the basic needs every day. And so thank you for bringing that up. Um, it is definitely something that I can just say from my own experience, I've had both of my kids return home as young adults, um, I was speaking in my presentation a little bit more towards the younger, you know, uh, youth, but from my own personal experience that you're absolutely right. I've had both my kids come to live back home for some period of time um, in recent years, you know, pandemic related or otherwise. So yes, it's a big issue and it's a, it's a burden. Okay. Um, thanks. And again, we know this has been a lot of information. We usually are when we hear about, you know, some of the issues that we address. What I would like, to, what I'm wondering if I could ask, if you wouldn't mind, um, Lisa, um, as another action item for folks that are on the, on this call in this meeting who might be interested in becoming a member a member of the suicide prevention council um knowing again that is a resource where becoming a member of the council can get you information on resources and best practices related to suicide um if you could drop um oop, it looks like lisa put on her email address in the chat and we'll include that in the in the meeting notes. Um, but that's also something for folks who are interested in sort of connecting with the work that's going on. And again, that's occurring outside of state government, although the state government, our state agencies are, you know, valued partners in that work. Um, and if you could indulge me all a little bit too, um, with if there's just to ask if there's anybody else that has a final comment or question before we move on to the uh, SAMHSA grant updates. Okay, well, thank you to all of the presenters who are here today to give us, you know, a little bit of the information about what they're doing within their world. I think one thing we can probably take away from this is, or we should take away is, it takes a village. There is not one program, one agency, or just one effort that will address those numbers that we saw or that we heard um, about earlier related to suicide, and that was just focused on suicide among youth, and we know it's a broader issue. Um, so thank you for, you know, giving us like a little glimpse of what the work is going on and, and hopefully we can continue keeping this in mind as we do our work as the, um, as the suicide prevention subcommittee. I'm sorry, I was getting my committees confused as this ch child and youth behavioral health subcommittee, forgive me. Um, with that, it, can we hand it over to you, um, Sherry, um, to talk about some of the grant updates? Sure, absolutely. I have um, two updates and one is actually going back to the summer. I want to thank everybody who was able to attend our 2023 Texas System of Care and CRCG conference in Austin this summer or virtually. 
And I want to do a reminder that if you weren't able to attend or if there were sessions that you missed, all of the workshops and uh, keynote speakers sessions are online and accessible to anyone who wants to watch. So I'm going to drop that link into the chat and just invite everyone to to go back and look at what you might have missed um, or go in and, and watch all of the conference if you weren't able to attend. And the second really brief update I have is that we are entering that time of year where we're going to start working on the Texas Creative Arts Mental Health Contest. We anticipate that we'll start taking entries in um, probably early to mid-December. So look for more information to come about the Creative Arts Contest. Really excited um, about that. We were able to create a calendar with uh, last year's winners. So hopefully you've been able to get your hands on one of those. And then we'll also be starting um, work to uh, provide the activity for the ch Children's Mental Health acceptance day um, event that will be in Travis County. Um, so you may have been uh, on that work group in the past. So look for emails and more information to come about that as well, uh, or probably in your communities around the state, you'll have your own event. So I encourage everyone to participate in children's mental health acceptance day events um, coming to your area in May. And those are my two updates, so I can pass it back to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Sherry. And I just mm -hmm. want to say for like you know real pro life tips in the chat. Um, Linda from Texas Parent to Parent reminded folks that if you want to save the good information that's been shared, including links, um, in the chat. If you click on the three dots are at the bottom of the chat pane, it'll give you an option to save the chat history. Um, this is why we have you here, Linda. You know, you um, you keep us um, efficient. Thank you. Um, I think that one of the next agenda items that we have is just an update on um, the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and I think our activities with that, you know, sort of our parent group in that sense. Um, I just wanted to share that uh, the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee, um, which is who, would, which is an entity that advises the Executive Commissioner of the Health and Human Services Commission on um, issues related to behavioral health services and programs, um, is required to submit an annual report to the Texas Legislature that includes recommendations that the BHAC has made. Um, and we are one of the subcommittees um, to the BHAC. And so that annual report um, includes a section on the activities that we have done in the previous year, including recommendations that we have made. Um, so uh, we submitted that information, uh, a draft of um, a draft report, I think of our work, some of the topics and the issues that we have addressed in the past year. Um, that will be included. And what we've also did as, as folks, you know, who have been engaged with um, our CIBIS group in the past know that um, during our quarterly meetings, we will often um, break up into uh, in breakout rooms where we'll glean, we'll ask questions and we'll glean some information and feedback. So what we did is we pulled some information there um, to share with uh, as part of our report. And I will say issues that we have talked about today, I think were addressed in there um, related to the intersection of mental health and um, um, autism and IDD, um, challenges of accessing services in rural areas, challenges presented by the workforce, um, which, you know, again, we keep hearing about seeing and the impact that that has um, on families' ability to access the services that their kids need in a timely manner. So I um, just wanted to share that brief update about our, and then so I think that is still going through its final review and then we'll be able to have that, um, we'll be looking forward to that and that report being published. Um, let me see, Is what is next on our agenda? I think now, oh, is there any questions or comments about um, the Behavioral Health Advisory Committee. 
Okay. Um, if not, I think we can move to public comment. Um, I know, um, Spahn, I believe you had sent information that you would like to um, officially speak now in this portion of public comment. Um, and I believe there may have been one other person as well, I know who reached out to me. Glenn, um, one of our wonderful stewards over at the Texas Institute for um, Excellence in Mental Health has put information. Oh, there we see too, Stefan and, and, and Leah. So I think what we'll do first is um, if Stefan, if you- It's could... Stefan. I'm sorry, Stefan. Um, Stefan, if you could, you know, I think we'll give you the floor. Um, if you could let us know what agenda item that you're speaking on and um, and share and share with us your thoughts. Can I just really quickly add um, if each of them could state your full name and what organization you're representing, or if you're or you're speaking as a private citizen, um, just a reminder that your comment is limited to three minutes. Thank you. My name is Stefan Cole. I am a board member for Texas Parent to Parent. However, today I am speaking as a private citizen. Um, in the area that I live in, talking about uh, the children's mental health plan, strategic plan, is something I've had a lot of interest in and been trying to reach out to get more help in the local area that I'm currently in. Um. We have no ADA coordinator to go to if there are issues with the school systems um, or any access in general. Our county websites um, are not accessible for people with IDDs. Um, the, the amount of the lack of backup when there are issues for our children is absolutely horrendous. Um, I spent, I believe it was three and a half weeks on the phone with my son's um, Texas Star kids to try to find a counselor that would even do telehealth for autism behavioral, not ABA, just behavioral therapy to help with his ADHD because uh, he has that in combination. And still to this day, we cannot find someone that specializes that in the state of Texas that takes that, that takes Texas Star Kids. There is a lot of issues when it comes to the general children's well-being of having access to proper health care and accommodations that are fitting for each individual child. Um, and what I mean by that is, yes, you can have general accommodations for a child in school of how they learn and process information but some kids need something that's different or more in individualized and i really hope that's something that becomes part of the strategic plan for children's mental health thank you um Mr. Cole, I appreciate those comments. Um, does anybody have any, you know, sort of questions for Stefan? Okay, thank you. So I know, and then we also have um, one more and um, submission for public comment, and it's uh, is it Leah or Leah Kelly? And again, reminding. It's, it, oh, it's yeah. Leah. It's Leah. Thank you. You can just. Um, I think it was like your name and I think who you represent. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Leah Kelly. I am a native Texan living in the greater Austin area, commenting today as a private citizen and a community member. I'm speaking um, related to the item of the Children's Strategic Behavioral Health Plan, specifically suicide prevention. I'm also the parent of an autistic child who has significant mental health needs. My comment today addresses the lack of mental health resources available in my child's school district. While they do have licensed mental health professionals on each campus and access to TCHAT, it is grossly insignificant to meet the demands of the community. With the ever-increasing needs, especially since the pandemic, 
a series of deaths by suicide of children in my county, it concerns me that there are such large gaps in services for 74,000 children and families. What, if anything, can be done to ensure there is equitable access to services and resources available to all children in our state? I know that there are funding sources available to assist families with basic needs with years of data to substantiate improved mobility rates and mental health outcomes. This also leads to improved academic outcomes. I am frustrated the children in my child's school districts don't have that same access to these resources. Meeting basic needs is a form of suicide prevention. And I know that you can't really engage in dialogue with me, but I wanted to take this opportunity to make a comment to record my concern for equity of access for children in my child's school district. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate um your your information and, and feedback and input um, to both of you. Um, okay, so I think, let's see, um, Vera Lynn, on the agenda, I think we're down to, oh, maybe we even just bumped up, we have a little bit more extra time. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I'm realizing we never did vote in or take a vote for the family health services. I don't know if we still have quorum. Is that something that, um, we should, we're able to get done today, Sherry. Um, I think we did take a vote. Did we take a vote? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We're good. And it was <laughs> yeah. Yes. That was before I had food in my system <laughs> for lunch. I apologize for that. Um, okay. So I think it looks like now then just to sort of review some of the action items or the agenda items for next month. Um, I know that I will just say, you know, based on my notes, that we've had some folks volunteer to be a part of that ad hoc committee um, that will assist Vera Lynn in um, providing input to the uh, Children's Mental Health Plan sort of task force. Um, and I took down my notes and I've also saved the chat, but I'm hoping that some other folks that are helping with note taking in the back will also have that. For those folks who are interested or if you um, haven't yet expressed it, feel free to reach out to us and we can add you that list and then look for information on, you know, how that will be sort of structured or what the process will be. Um, I know another item is in getting the slide decks that were shared today. Um, you know, during the presentation and sending out copies of those either with the meeting notes, if not, hopefully, maybe even before. Um, was it, what are some, was there any other action items from today that were missed? Or that we should, you know, we should take note of? Well, I, I just want to mention, uh, and I think we talked about it in our meetings, that the Texas Family Voice Network, it is still in existence. We're just taking some care, taking time for, for the board right now and trying to get everything revamped, but we're trying to take care of our, ourselves first. Uh, and that is something also that the BHAC has recommended that they will continue to support us uh, as they can. So Texas Family Voice Net Network is still in existence. We just taking a little take care of time. Thank you. Thank you, Verlin, for that, for all the work that y'all are continuing to do, even though, like you said, if there's even if it's taking a little pause on stuff, we know that the the where there is work going on, um, maybe just not under that umbrella. Um I could also just wanted to say that there's also some additional comments I know from from Greta James Maxfield in the comment, I think that's something too that we'll put on maybe a list to discuss or to inform future conversations or input. Um, I think if there's nothing else, oh, also a reminder, next, our next quarterly meeting is January 10th in 2024. Oh my gosh, we're already turning the calendar year. Um, any other parting words? A lot of information. I'll thank you so much for staying on and being engaged. And a lot of good information we can take back to our communities and use. 
So thank everyone for uh, presenting and for being a part of this uh, subcommittee today. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.